It's a night like any other. I'm at my computer, I get in a call with the boys, settle in to play a game, and I begin to browse. And browse. Man, I really don't feel like playing any of my games. And my cousin's like, You know, I never bought you a birthday present. So, uh, Octopath Traveler? Now, I've heard of this game before. My cousin bought it for my brother's birthday, and then my brother became obsessed with it. And now he's buying it for me. Like, the game's so good man's buying it for everyone's birthday. So the game's gotta be special or something, right? So I graciously accept. And 156 hours later, here we are. Yeah. I really like Octopath Traveler. And I mean, what's not to love? This game has been praised for its music, art, visual effects, battle system, you name it. And I'll link videos that talk about these things down below in case you're interested. But there's one aspect of this game that I truly love, an aspect that I treasure, that many people seem to criticize. One of the worst parts about Octopath Traveler is in some of its main storylines, as a few of them are pretty weak and uninteresting. I want the characters to feel like they're all going on a huge adventure together, one that kind of ties together, but this just feels like I'm playing multiple entirely unrelated stories. There are no interweaving plot lines, and worse than that, there pretty much can't be any. And I'll be honest, this really bothers me. The only reason I can come up with for people not liking the story is if they haven't finished it. According to my Steam achievements, only 10% of players have finished the character's stories and 5% the optional endgame boss, which continues the stories. But even then, I find it strange how people couldn't see the beauty in these storylines from the beginning, as they are set up for greatness from the moment you enter the game. As the title suggests, this game, these stories, I firmly believe changed my life, or at the very least reminded me of important moral values and truths that greatly enhanced my life. I'd argue that this game's story was thought through and masterfully done, just like the rest of the game. Beautiful, in every sense of the word. But what makes a story beautiful? Well, that's a good question, and a difficult one to answer. We all find beauty in different things, after all. But what I will say is that there's a difference between an entertaining or even a good story and a beautiful one. A beautiful story requires that people find meaning or purpose in the story. It's something that stays with you even after it is finished. It is often eye-opening or life-changing. But in order for a story to have this effect, it must make a connection with the reader, or listener, or watcher, however the story is being portrayed. And that's why it's hard to say what makes a story beautiful, since people find connection in different things. It can be as simple as shared humor, or as complex as a shared traumatic experience. So a truly great story is one that can relate to people in all flocks of life. So when you have a game that has eight unique characters with separate unique storylines, we're already set up for the player to find a connection. First, we have Ophelia, a cleric, whose adoptive father is dying. She takes it upon herself to perform a sacred journey in her sister's stead, that her sister might stay by his side. There's Cyrus, a scholar, whose thirst for knowledge and problem solving leads him on a journey to find a missing tome from 15 years ago, which then leads him to find much darker secrets. Tressa is a merchant, who longs to see the world, and sets out on a journey to discover it, as well as to prove herself in her trade. Ulbrich is a noble warrior, who after losing king and country is left without purpose in life, wondering why it is he wields his blade, and needing to find his purpose again. Primrose is a dancer, whose father was murdered by three men when she was a child, and has taken it upon herself to avenge her father by killing these men. Alfin is an apothecary, who was saved as a child from a deadly illness, and has made it his life mission to repay that kindness forward by healing the sick and weary on his travels. Therion is a thief, and best boy in my personal opinion, whose lack of foresight leads him into a trap, requiring him to steal back lost heirlooms in order to have a mark of shame removed from him, and Hannet, a skilled huntress, whose master disappears while on a hunt. She must go after him to find out what happened and what went wrong. All different characters from different walks of life. Players are bound to find a connection with at least one of these characters, even for the smallest of things. For me, I related to Primrose purely because she is a dancer. I did dance for four years in high school and even considered doing it professionally at one point. When I first saw Primrose, it was pretty obvious she does a different kind of dancing than I do, but the fact that she was a dancer at all was enough for me to feel a connection to her immediately. Surely one or two of these piqued your interest, but what if you don't like all the characters' stories and don't want to play through them all? Well, Octopath allows you to choose. You can play the entire game solo and the game will scale to having a party of one. Or you can go gather all eight characters, it's entirely up to you. Therion's whole story can happen whether or not Primrose's does, so even for replaying this game, you have a lot of options to change up the experience. This customizable experience is something truly unique to this game, as most RPGs, or games in general, have one linear storyline. Many people find this jarring at first. As you heard earlier, there are some who wish the characters were more connected, going on a big adventure together. But this is exactly the case. As I played through this game, I found that the characters are far more connected than I could have imagined. 
their journeys meaning far more than I would have ever anticipated. The best stories, in my experience, are those that grab the attention of the audience, are purposeful in everything that occurs, and then finds resonance in their heart. And that, my friends, is the definition of Octopath. But I think that's enough introduction. How about we get into the heart of this game so you can experience this magic for yourself? I'll be walking you through my experience with the eight stories in summarized detail. Basically, this will serve as a nice recap for those who have played the game and provide enough detail for those who are new to it. From this point on, major spoilers are afoot. Like, the entire story and plot of this game level spoilers, so in case it wasn't obvious before, you have now been warned. Let's start with Primrose, since she was the character I started with. As I briefly mentioned, Primrose witnessed three men with crow tattoos kill her father when she was a child. When starting her story, she is working as a dancer in Sunshade, where tale has it, one of these men often stops by. Her master Helganish is an absolute creep, and I really, really wanted her to smack him. But all in due time, because eventually the left-hand man shows up. And yes, the game actually calls him this, don't at me. A fellow dancer, Yusufa, says she'll distract Helganish while Primrose goes after the guy. But plot twist, the left-hand man is working with him. Prim chases the man down and we get into our first dungeon where the battle system is explained. For anyone wondering, it's a typical turn-based system with some unique mechanics like breaking and battle points. Yeah, this page will come back to haunt me. But eventually, I make it out to the sands where, what do you know, it's Mr. Creepo of the Year. And crap, he's got Yusufo with him. Who he kills? I have just started this game, what is happening? The boss fight begins, and I do gotta say, the boss designs in this game are really cool. Like, I hate this guy, but I have to admit his boss art is cool. Starting with a support character makes the boss fight extra hard, because Primo's just ain't that strunk. But after a few tries and leveling up a bit, I beat him. Helganish dies, we get a map off of him, and it looks like the left-hand man can be found in the town of Still Snow. That ends her chapter one. But before I go on to her chapter two, something very important happened right after the fight. With whatever character you start with, you'll run into a side quest character outside the starting town named Kit. He'll ask if you are on a journey, and says he is on one to find his father, who he hasn't seen since he was a boy. He wishes you luck, and says you may meet again. A simple enough encounter that I instantly brushed aside. Little did I know, this foreshadowed the end of the game. But for now, on to chapter 2. Primrose arrives in Still Snow and begins searching for the left-hand man, and in doing so, she meets an old servant of her house, Azelheart, Ariana, who seems reluctant to share her new occupation. Sus. But upon showing her the map, she spills the beans. Turns out this town has a dark and dirty little secret. A- hmm, Is that YouTube safe? I'm not sure it is. Basically, Ariana is, uh, one of these? Yeah, if you know, you know. It's a whole operation they got going on, and the left-hand man runs the place. This actually shocked me quite a bit. I didn't expect the game to include a more serious topic like this, which isn't a bad thing. In a way, I'm impressed that the developers weren't afraid to take a more serious route in their storytelling. But if you were thinking this sounded like a nice game to get for your eight-year-old, you might want to reconsider. After convincing the carriage driver to take me to this place, there are some flashbacks where Primrose's father, Jeffrey, teaches her their house motto. Faith shall be your shield. Engraved on the knife she now carries. She begins to wonder what it is she believes in, and then she arrives at the obsidian parlor. Time to find the left-hand man, Rufus. Primrose confronts him and discovers the crows killed her father because he stuck his nose in their business. Boss fight begins, she kills Rufus, pretty simple. As he dies, he tells her to return home to Noble Court to find the truth. The ending for this chapter really stuck with me. It was the first time I noticed Prim's theme music as she wonders what it is she has faith in. The scene ended and I just sat there in the snow, listening to the music. Beautiful, but hollow. What Primrose had said about faith hit me pretty hard, because I think we all have to evaluate what we believe in at some point or many points in our lives. Whether it's inconsequential or of great significance, we often have to figure out what we agree or disagree with, what we believe or don't believe, and it can be confusing when you're right in the thick of it. Just as Primrose is now, wondering if her purpose, her faith, really is so tried and true. This was starting to turn from a cool adventure story into something more real, and this is the biggest reason I fell in love with this game. Primrose's chapter 3 starts with her entering Noble Court, only to see that a man has been murdered. Okay then. Prim notices the city guard is absent, and the prior captain of the guard, Ravello, leaving the scene. Looks like someone else rules this town now. Cut to another part of the city, and it would appear the right-hand man is the one in charge here. I began going through the city only to get another cutscene where she runs into a childhood friend, Simeon and not a bad looking someone if I do say so myself. As they are talking, I start to understand who this guy is. Does Prim have a love interest? Oh yeah, she definitely does. 
And honestly, it made me so happy. It was looking like Simeon is a compassionate, charismatic guy who treats her right. Prim, this one's a keeper. I was very intrigued to see how this would play out with the revenge story. Primrose finds Ravello and learns that after Jeffrey's death, the Obsidians had taken over Noble Court. They had been working in the shadows of the city, and when people tried to stop them, they were killed. Ravello reveals the location of their headquarters and says he'll accompany Primrose on her mission. Time to beat up another crow. This guy's name is Albus, the second in command to Jeffrey who everyone thought had also been murdered. He sold out Jeffrey. The person Jeffrey had trusted most ended up being a traitor, but it turns out that a similar treachery was about to be repeated. After Primrose beats Albus, her and Ravello go to leave, and out of nowhere, Simeon shows up. Wait. I mean, maybe he figured out what she's doing and he's gonna be like, I can't condone this, but I will support you if this is the path you choose. Yeah, that sounds like something he'd say. So he walks up to her and freaking stabs her in the gut. I have two things to say about this. One, that is not how you pick up chicks, bro. If you wanted to play hero, you should have been here five minutes ago, stabbing the guy who is currently lying dead on the floor. But two, why do the charismatic attractive ones always end up being the bad guy? Is having a charming guy who isn't a jerk with an ego or who ends up being fake that much to ask for? I mean, Therion is close, but he's still a thief. Like, I can't condone that morally. But yeah, freaking Simeon. What the heck, man? So he's the leader of the crows? It was me. The audacity of this man. He has this whole monologue in evil playwright fashion and then he leaves her to die. Thankfully, Ravello turns back and finds her, getting her the medical attention she needs. Primrose dreams of her childhood when Simeon would stay by her side, comforting her, giving her peace, and promising to always watch over her. You dirty, filthy- <laughs> The chapter ends with her recovering and setting out for Everhold, to end what she has started. There's definitely more to this story than I've related here, but I hope this is enough for you to begin seeing the depth Prim's story has. This chapter was a roller coaster, and the fact that Simeon was her childhood love sets us up for an emotional final chapter. Upon arriving in Everhold, it's pretty obvious Simeon runs the place. Prim enters the theater to find Simeon waiting, saying the play tonight is one he wrote specially for her. It's her life, all of her memories put on display for the world to see. Now that's just cruel. The theater is by far the biggest dungeon in the game, so there were plenty of opportunities for snippets of the play to come through, recounting Prim's life. At her birth, her parents knew they'd raise her to be a strong and compassionate lady. Next, she is a young child, and she has worked very hard on a dance to show her father. He asks her to forgive him, as he has put too many of his expectations on her so young. She replies that she is strong, and that her purpose is to bring glory to House Azelheart. Jeffrey replies that someday she must find a cause of her own, a purpose that will bring her happiness. Similar to Prim's crisis of faith, this scene hit me pretty hard. You can only go through life for so long before you realize that living life to meet others' expectations, or to please other people, is an unfulfilling way to live. There's an element of being a responsible person people can rely on, and an element of having enough self-worth to realize you deserve happiness too. It's a similar message as one found in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, one of my favorite films, I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. But in that story, Miles has to learn that he can be his own Spider-Man, that he has gifts unique to him that allow him to accomplish things others can't. And in being you, and finding your happiness, true happiness, is where life can be most fulfilling. Primrose comes out onto the balcony to face Simeon, and he says he stabbed her in such a way that she could live or die because it adds drama. Twit. He calls this the final act of a tragedy, and that his only joy in life is watching other people fall apart. You know, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something mighty weird about this guy. Simeon claims her father wouldn't have wanted her to seek revenge. There's a series of flashbacks recalling the events of her life, through which she finds resolve, saying her father would understand. Primrose regrets nothing. Simeon tries getting in her head, and she stop cries it. out for him to stop. Just and then the scene shifts, stop. back in front of her house, with her father. She tells him that she had hated life without him. The loneliness. She hated it. But it's almost over now. Please, father. Forgive me. Back on the balcony, Simeon continues his bombardment, but she is resolved. My faith shall be my shield against you! Boss fight time. Time for the main event. <laughs> Not bad. A passing grade. Even up to his death, Simeon continues his monologue about this being a play. He recites the poem he had written for her years ago, and then we get a striking contrast. As the play reaches its end and the girl says yes to the young man's proposal, there is Primrose, standing over Simeon's dead body. 
The scene fades to Primrose visiting her father's grave in Noble Court, able to face him after having avenged him. And yet, there is still pain in her heart, and she doesn't know what to do now. What cause will carry me on from here? But this is something I must find for myself. And until I do, I will keep dancing. This was such a powerful line, and was a callback to chapter 1, where our story began. At the end here, Primrose is talking to Jazz, Ravello's son, and though nothing is really given, I wonder if maybe she found a happy life with him. What I found so incredible about this story was the fact that carrying out her revenge didn't solve her problems. Many revenge stories end in everyone dying as a result, or the character driving themselves insane. But that didn't happen here. She is alive and well, she carried out her mission, and she doesn't know what it was for or what to do now. This felt so raw and real, and it's a great contrast to the other characters' stories. Where many of them find a purpose or cause, she is left no longer having a purpose and needing to find one. And despite this, her story feels complete. The story ends and an ending card is displayed, showing her in an open field, relaying a lot of emotions. But the biggest one to me was, strangely enough, that of peace. Not only was the story greatly written from a plot standpoint, but there were so many opportunities to find something relatable or meaningful. I finished Primrose's story motivated and uplifted, despite the dark nature of her tale. It was really eye-opening, as was Alphen's story, which we'll talk about next. Alphen's story revolves around a traveling apothecary that saved him when he was a child. The man saved him and didn't ask for payment, and when Alphen asked why, the man said, I saw someone in a bind and I helped him out. Simple as that. Since that day, Alphen has become an apothecary and wants to travel the world, helping people just like that man. But he doesn't know how to tell his friend Zeph. Eventually, it comes out that Zeph knew all along, and he tells Alf to follow his dreams. There's a cool scene where they exchange satchels as a way to remember each other, and then Alphen heads out to begin his journey. That went a lot faster than Prim's chapter 1, but that's because there aren't as many important details in his beginning chapters. Primrose's conflict was present from the beginning, avenging her father, while Alphen's main conflict doesn't pick up until chapter 3. I think this may be the reason some people find the stories boring at first. If you start with someone like Alphen or Ophelia, it could seem like the stories are lackluster or ragtag adventures rather than deeply moving stories. I get why people can find this upsetting, but these chapters have a place. They do something that stories like Primrose's can't. They show the simplicity of life. Now sure, it's not every day you go fight a giant venomous snake to save your friend's sister. This is the conflict in this chapter, but has no bearing on the rest of Alphen's story. But if you look at the chapter as a whole, it's just a guy living his life. He's got a dream and a will to follow it. And somehow, it's beautiful to see that. Maybe you're a medical student with a goal to help people like Alphen. Or maybe you have a goal to become a great seamstress, actor, programmer, plumber. It could be anything. The principle still applies. Now, if done wrong, this kind of story can come across as boring and lifeless. After all, life is filled with excitements and events, and a story needs to properly portray that. But life also has its simple moments. Sometimes life lacks excitement without it being any less good. What I'm trying to say is that this is a unique take for a video game, and I think they got it right. In an industry that often breaks the boundaries of reality and fantasy, it's refreshing to see something more grounded. There's beauty in simplicity. Not everything needs to be action-packed and high stakes to be good. Studio Ghibli has proved that well. And Alphen's story pulls off this grounded feel while still holding enough excitement to carry you through to the more exciting Chapter 3. But for now, his Chapter 2 follows a similar vein. This takes place in Goldshore, where there's an apothecary, Vanessa, who makes people sick in order to sell them a remedy at a high price. Which is honestly so evil. Alphen takes her down and we get to see more of Alphen's personality. A little girl he cured and her sister give him shells as a goodbye present. And Alphen tears up over it. We love to see a guy in touch with his emotions. And he goes on his way more resolved than ever to help people. Chapter 3 takes place in Saintsbridge and opens up with a man who is injured and asking for aid. A mysterious man says he'll help him if he answers a question, only for Mr. Mystery to say his life isn't worth saving. Alphen shows up and asks how he could say that only for a mystery man to leave, saying he can choose his patience. Alphen helps the man, Miguel, and goes to get some food while Miguel rests. At the tavern, a young boy is collapsed, but Alphen doesn't know how to help him. Cue mystery man, and of course, he knows exactly what to do, leaving Alphen to be in awe of his skill. His name is Ogan, and he tells Alphen not to judge a man before you get to know him. Alphen is now determined to become a better apothecary. He continues treating people in town, and as he does so, he mentions Miguel to this elderly woman. She is taken aback and says Miguel is a thief who recently snuck into a house and killed the butler when he was discovered. 
Therion, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on this. On the way out, Alfin runs into Ogun again, where it's revealed that this is the reason Ogun refused to treat him. Ogun repeats that some lives aren't worth saving. You really like that line, don't you, Ogun? Alfin replies that they aren't gods who get to choose who lives or dies. As apothecaries, it's their job to help anyone in need. Which, honestly, fair point. But I can also see where Ogun's hesitation comes from. I get the feeling there's a reason for it. Ogun asks if saving the life of a killer is really saving a man's life, and Alfin ponders this as he heads back to Miguel. He's in worse shape, and Alfin confronts him about his profession. Miguel says he only did it to feed his three kids back home. Alfin says he'll help Miguel, but only if he stops thieving, to which he readily agrees, and Alfin then spends the night tending to his wounds. He wakes up the next day to find Miguel gone. In fact, he's now in town holding the little boy from the tavern hostage, running off to the woods when he spots Alfin. Alfin goes after Miguel, and upon finding him, he's beaten up the kid. Which I agree, Alfin, that's really messed up. Miguel slips up in his story, saying he has four mouths to feed instead of three, only proving further that Miguel never intended to change his ways. Get him, Alfin. Get him. Get him. The fight opens Miguel's wounds again, causing him to pass out. Alfin saves the boy, leaving Miguel to die, I assume. The boy ends up fine, and as Ogun leaves town a while later, Alfin asks what he could have done differently. Was he wrong to save Miguel? Ogun says that life is a series of choices, and he simply made a poor one. He recounts how he had once taken a wounded criminal into his home, helped him out of the goodness of his heart, only for him to come home one day to find his wife murdered. He had saved the wrong life. Those hands of yours can shape the world. Think before you use them. There was another who practiced his craft the way you do. I just don't know. Alfin is left not knowing what the right answer is, and wondering what his hero would have done. And with these questions in mind, Alfin sets out for Orwell. Ogun is also an Orwell, but he's acting strange, coughing and dropping his tools constantly. The story comes full circle when Alfin discovers Ogun is sick with the same disease he almost died to as a child. But Ogun sees himself as a sinner. He guilts himself over the death of his wife. After her death, he wandered from town to town, just so he could help anybody. A few years later, he found the man who had killed his wife. He now had a family of his own, and he killed him. As an apothecary who saves lives, he had taken the life of another. And now he is biding his time until he dies. He wants to die. Alfin is conflicted. How do I even go about fixing a busted soul? I'm just one man. One small, insignificant man. As he ponders this, he finds a letter in his satchel from his friend Zeph, through which he finds courage. He refuses to let Ogun die. He still has so much to live for, if only he could see it. So, reaching into his memory, Alfin is able to find what ingredient he needs to make the cure. This part of the story was so cool. He needs to get an ogre eagle feather. And I will say this boss fight was really annoying. The bird keeps sweeping members of your party away and sapping away your max health and SP. But the chapter 4 boss theme music is so incredibly beautiful that I didn't mind having to do the fight multiple times purely for the music. Ooh, that slaps hard. In the end, Ogun is saved, just as he had been saved many years ago by a man named Graham Crossford. Ogun, look at your hands. Just two, and yet they have the power to save innumerable lives. Live, Ogun, if not for yourself, for those who still need you. All around you, People are suffering, dying. There are plenty of lives you might yet save, if you have it in you to save them. Why? Why are you helping me? What's that? When someone's in a bind, you help them out. Simple as that, wouldn't you say? 
he was the same man who saved Alfin. They were both saved by Graham, only to meet each other later in life. This was seriously the coolest thing. It was hard not to cry at the chapter's end, as Ogun says Alfin is almost the spitting image of Graham's character, and that he's carrying on his legacy well. Alfin sets out to save more lives. There's still people out there needing saving. Lives worth saving. And I'm over here trying not to sob as this theme music plays and I get hit with a stunning end card. It was emotional not only because it was the first story I finished, but because of the beautiful message his story contained. Life. Life is such a precious thing. Alfin's story had me reflecting on death, misery, hopelessness, alongside the importance of beauty of life and carrying on. Once again, showing this game's depth and ability to deal with important topics. This one man, Graham Crossford single-handedly changed the course of so many lives, but each of his actions on their own may be considered small or insignificant. As someone who has recently had a crisis of finding meaning and purpose in life, it was an incredible wake-up call, realizing that even the smallest actions could be changing hundreds of lives, and that I didn't have to do something big and grand in order to have a purpose or make a difference. Even that one time I may have complimented someone or gave them a smile could have been enough to help that person carry on. I know people have done that for me. And even if we can't see it, we all do that for each other. This is what Alfin's story gave to me. There's something amazing in finding meaning in life, especially after you feel like you've lost it. Seeing Alfin come to find his meaning gave me hope that even if I don't have all the answers now, I will find them eventually. And I'm really grateful for that. Next up, it's time to talk about Therion. If you couldn't tell already, he ended up being my favorite. Therion is a cute, <laughs> mean, cool, and elusive thief who wanders into the town of Boulderfall one day and hears of great treasures to be had. Seeing two other thieves in the tavern causes Therion to remember his youth. He was thrown to the gals and met another kid, who was obsessed with tea for whatever reason, named Darius. And using the key Therion lifted off the guard, they escaped. Back in the present, the barkeep advises Therion not to break into the Ravis Manor, as many thieves have already tried and failed, but Therion won't back down from a challenge. He finds the place on lockdown, but it appears merchants are let in when they have a letter of introduction. Time to go steely steely. On his way to do this, the two thieves in the tavern ask to join him. He turns them down and we get another flashback. This time, he and Darius are working together. This flashback intrigued me because there seemed to be some hesitation in Therion as they looked over the money they've just stolen. Interesting. Therion finds a merchant with the letter, steals it, and gets it to the mansion. I would expect nothing less of our master thief. When he gets to the final room, he's met by a super butler named Heathcote. Epic name, by the way. Who he fights. Therion wins, but Heathcote manages to sneak a fool's bangle on him, the sign of a convict and a disgrace to any thief. As a man who has little in the way of friends, the only thing he has left is his skills as a thief. This band, a fool's bangle, is a clear sign of his worst nightmare. He got caught. Cordelia, the lady of the house, then appears and explains that Therion needs to steal back three dragon stones, important family heirlooms that were lost after her parents' death. Thankfully, Heathcote already got the sapphire one back. Suspicious, but do continue. Once the stones are returned, Therion will have the band removed. So, using Therion's pride as a bargaining tool, I see. He doesn't really have a choice, and begrudgedly agrees. Cordelia and Heathcote see him off, which annoys him and I found interesting considering the nature of their deal. So, we have a lone wolf with a mysterious background who needs to restore his honor and has a personality and looks to boot. Welp, if you didn't have my attention before, you surely have it now. Therion's chapter 2 takes place in Noble Court. He hears talk of someone named Orlik who does research on a red stone. Bingo. Ruby Dragonstone located. It's pretty clear there's no easy way into the house, so Therion heads to the tavern for info. Turns out Orlik had a research partner, Barum. They split up after a disagreement, but he still lives in town. Therion finds Barum and asks for his help. Barum agrees on the condition that Therion provide him with some expensive research materials. Good thing money isn't an object here. He learns that Barum actually wants him to steal the stone. He says Orlik became possessed by the Dragonstone. He wouldn't let people near him. They'd been like brothers, and Barum wants his brother back. This leaves an impression on Therion, and turns out the materials were for a key to be used in the mansion. Barum gives Therion a password for the front gate as well. Then we get a flashback to Therion and Darius. Tension has grown between them, with Darius holding back on their spoils for the day. Back in the present, Therion enters the mansion and fights Orlik for the stone, then heads back to House Ravis. I'm sure Heathcote's got new orders for me. Hooray. Here, Cordelia suggests removing the bangle from Therion, which wasn't something I was expecting. She thinks he's trustworthy, and Therion says she has too much faith in people. No matter how much you trust someone, they will betray you. So she better build her walls higher. Heathcote says it's best the band remain in place. Mm-hmm. He then tells Therion the Emerald Stone can be found at the Black Market in Wellspring, a black market that only thieves and the like should know about. 
Mm-hmm. Therion leaves and Cordelia says she can't help but think that Therion's face looked lonely and reminded her of herself. In Wellspring, Therion pays off a popper. In doing this, he finds he must order something off the menu at the tavern. Soon enough, the barkeep slips him a paper telling him to go to a cave outside of town. The cave is easy enough to find and it appears they have a dress code, so we can either steal a mask or get a list of the goods off the bartender. I went with the first one, so I don't really know what happens if you steal the list instead, but I do believe both are options and provide slightly different cutscenes depending on what you choose. I get into the market, find the stone, but right as Therion is about to steal it, this other group of thieves steals it instead. No, it's fine. It's not like I needed it or anything. Therion catches the thieves, but right as he's about to fight them, oh my gosh, is that Darius? <sighs> and wow, you can really hear the pain in Therion's voice. What on earth did you do to Therion? Darius is also after the Dragonstones, and he's just as obsessed with tea. He notices the bangle on Therion and starts layering on the insults. Ugh, I hate this guy. Therion fights the thief underlings, leading to one of the most emotional backflashes yet. The crooks Therion and Darius had bested from the last flashback? Yeah, they hired Darius to kill Therion, and he agreed in a heartbeat. Darius saw Therion's talent and manipulated him to be an asset to himself, a stepping stool. But when he caught Therion starting to doubt him, he decided it was time to get rid of him. And he throws him off a cliff! Good riddance. As I'm watching this unfold, everything starts to make sense. His aloof and lonely demeanor, his cynical comments about friendship and camaraderie. Yeah, he has a good reason to act that way. The one person he trusted in the world called him a pile of scrap, said his life was meaningless, and tried to kill him the second he wasn't useful. It made me sick. Darius had no right, no one has a right to treat someone that way. Therion catches up to Darius, and he's still more than willing to tear Therion down for his own benefit. Does my betrayal still haunt you? Darius leaves things to his lackey Gareth, and he makes off with the Dragonstone, leaving us with Gareth as the boss fight. This fight was super annoying. Gareth has this stupid ability where he steals your SP, your mana, your ability to use special attacks, yeah that thing. So I went to level up a bit in the cave, and it's about this time that I unlock my first divine skill. These skills are basically an ultimate ability, and are only usable when you fully boost an attack. Remember this page that I said would haunt me? Yeah, I'm 30 hours into the game at this point, and it went a little something like this. Therion's divine skill deals damage based off of how high his speed is. I up his speed as much as I can, and I get into a fight to test it out. A fully boosted attack. So I probably need 5 battle points, right? Huh. I try boosting, still nothing. I read the description again, and it says fully boosted. I eye the right bumper on my controller, and since I'm out of options, I skeptically press it again. Oh my gosh, he's Super Saiyan! Let's do this! Now he's blue? I'm ready, are you? And he has an epic voice line? I'm in voice calls as I'm playing most of this game, so I explain what just happened. That's a key game mechanic. How did you miss that? <laughs> And for real, how did I? Did you know that being fully boosted strengthens your attacks or makes you attack four times when attacking normally? Do you know how much easier it would have been to break enemies if I'd known this, instead of single boosting myself for 30 hours? It's at this point that I realize I'm an idiot, but it's fine. At least I found out now rather than later. I guess. Anyway, I beat Gareth, and Therion brings the bad news back to House Ravis. Cordelia yet again notices Therion's demeanor and asks why he looks so sad, to which Therion says it isn't the business of a sheltered princess who's never known betrayal. Okay, Therion, you didn't have to and go- And I have? Well. This story just gets more interesting, doesn't it? Cordelia explains how people pretended to be her friend after her parents died. She thought them genuine until she realized all they wanted was her money. That's why the look on Therion's face had haunted her. She saw clearly the same pain she had once felt. Heathcote comes back in with his suspicious wealth of knowledge again. Darius is in Northreach, and he also has the Gold Dragonstone. Heathcote sets out to gain more info while Therion is left with Cordelia. He asks how she's able to trust people after everything that's happened, to which she answers, only the betrayed know the true meaning of trust. Something she learned from Heathcote, and he has never once betrayed her. Believing in other people is what makes people like she and Therion strong. Mr. Therion, I have faith in you. And with that, Therion goes on his way, more conflicted than ever. Therion's chapter 4 starts with him entering Northreach. Crazy, I know. Where the whole town is overrun by thieves. Upon entering the tavern, the barkeep nervously turns him away. 
weird. So Therion goes to leave, but notices a wanted this poster is... of himself. And his first reaction is that they didn't get his good side. Nice, yeah, th th that's a real shame that you're a wanted criminal in this town. I head further into town when suddenly Therion gets jumped by six guys. Which honestly isn't the bro thing to do. Like, I'ma keep it real, that's not very home slice broski home dog of you. But more keep on coming. Then Heathcote just appears and provides an escape route for him. Nice. Taking shelter in a house, it finally comes to light that Heathcote wasn't trained as a super butler, but was in fact a thief himself many years ago. I'm ashamed to say that I didn't see this coming. I honestly thought he'd be the cool sensei who has powers that never get explained. But dude, that makes so much sense. Heathcote's story is much like Therion's. He snuck into the manor as a young thief, got caught by Cordelia's father who made a deal with him. Heathcote would serve his child one day and in exchange, he wouldn't turn in Heathcote. And so here he is. I learned what it felt like to be believed in, and the value of believing in others. Wounds of betrayal run deep, but one must learn to have faith in others again before they can start to heal. Whoa, like, whoa. That hit different right there. Therion then promises to get the stones back. Darius's hideout is in the basement of this abandoned cathedral, so it was time to get a disguise to fool the lookouts. There were two options again, steal the leader's clothes or this underlings. I'll take that. I head to the cathedral, get my act on, laugh tremendously at the scene, and hurry to find the stones. The final room has both stones. And Darius. Darius, of course. He wants the stones because they'll grant him greater power, and says Therion must really want that bangle gone to have come this far. But Therion isn't there for him anymore. He's there for the people who trusted him. Those eyes. I hate those eyes. This new attitude starts eating at Darius, as he realizes he's no longer in control. But after you've betrayed so many people, it must get pretty damn lonely at the top. You're such a sentimental fool! Maybe I am a fool. But trust is a sentiment I want to believe in. And it's one worth fighting for! This fight is so cool as there's dialogue that happens during the battle. The only other boss to do this is Ophelia's chapter 4, and I was really happy to see it happen in Therion's as well. The I had Therion deal the final blow, plus I got his best line after finishing a fight. Where's the nearest tavern? What a way to end. Therion asks if Darius had gotten what he wanted after betraying him. Darius says he wanted to be at the top, no matter if he got there alone, no matter who he had to step on. He runs off to grab his treasure, to start Farewell. somewhere new. But turns out betraying Partner. people gets to you at some point. His men turn on him, leaving him to die, alone, with not a speck of gold to his name. Therion returns to Boulderfall with Heathcote. Cordelia goes to remove the bangle, but Heathcote reveals he'd already unlocked it back when Cordelia first mentioned it in Chapter 2. Heathcote, you did not. Huh? Therion laughs it off, and it's really unclear if he's trying to hide his embarrassment from not realizing sooner, or if he knew the whole time but went through with getting the stones anyway. I have no idea what the sound was, but that was my initial reaction. Apparently. Therion asks why the stones are so special, and Heathcote says they are the keys to unlocking the gate of Thinnis. <gasps> Bruh. Now, you may be confused if you know nothing of the story. Keep in mind, I did this chapter last out of all of them, so in this clip I already have more information than you do. I'm going to talk about Ulbricht's story next, so this can make more sense. But let's finish the story first. Cordelia goes to see Therion off one final time, to which Therion gives this hilarious outburst. Cordelia. She thanks him, and her and Heathcote turn to leave, only for Therion to call back and say, Thank you. The ending card was once again a masterpiece, and it's only made better by the theme music. So forlorn and sad, but with this picture it gives a sense of new beginning. Every theme song captures the characters so well. It honestly makes me want to cry. But that's probably just me being a sentimental sob for good stories and music. I wish I could spend more time on Therion's chapters. I found his story to be so much deeper than the edgelord loner everyone claims he is. Plus, your many pointed jokes about how attractive you find Therion would say otherwise. Guilty, as charged. But all jokes aside, I truly love his story. I saw his humor, and though I'm sure it's a part of his natural demeanor, I also saw it was a coping mechanism. Sometimes you have to joke about things in order not to cry about them. I saw the effects of betrayal and the true depths to which it can shake someone. 
how important trust is and how hard the path of healing is. I was amazed at his strength. We don't know much about his past, but from what we saw, it's been really tough. And after all of that, to have the only person in the world he could trust betray him, the fact that he is still standing and living day to day is amazing to me. That kind of strength is one to truly be admired. And to see him come to find people he can trust in, that even if it was small, to begin opening up just a little, was a beautiful thing. I could have made a whole video on Therion's story alone, and each of the others in turn. They all have so much depth, and I loved how his story centered around trust and being able to open up to others again. I wish I could spend more time here, but I can't talk about the end of the game without talking about all the stories. Yeah, you know how this game has eight separate storylines? That's what the developers wanted you to think. Get ready, it's time for Ulbrich's story. Ulbrich is a famous knight from the fallen kingdom of Hornburg, who now resides in Cobbleston. He was tasked with protecting his king, but failed to do so when his close friend and comrade, Erhard, turned out to be a rat and killed him. So, Ulbrich is now left without a purpose, wondering why it is he wields his blade and why on earth Erhard would do such a thing. A boy from town, Philip, gets kidnapped by some brigands in the mountains and Ulbrich goes to save him. The bandit leader, Gaston, has a sword Ulbrich recognizes as Erhard's. After defeating Gaston, he tells Ulbrich he used to fight with Erhard in a mercenary band. He doesn't know where Erhard is now, but he does know where another of the mercenaries is and he might know Erhard's location. His name is Gustav, the Black Knight in Victor's Hollow. Ulbrich sets out to find his purpose, and find out once and for all what happened on that day in battle. In Victor's Hollow, Ulbrich finds the town in the middle of a grand tourney, and in order to speak to Gustav, he must enter it. There's this weird rule that while the tourney is in session, you can have public duels and the law enforcement will turn a blind eye. And if you can beat one of the finalists in a public match, then you can take their place. Convenient. So, after finding a sponsor, this woman named Cecily, he challenges one of them and makes it into the tourney. Now he has to get to the final duel. Gustav says if Ulbrich can beat him, then he'll give him the information he wants. I found the tourney pretty funny, because it shows Ulbrich there, and then we get into battle and Ulbrich is like, Hey, I'd like you to meet my three friends who are going to help me kick your butt. I see nothing wrong here. It's for sure a fair fight. Ulbrich bests Gustav and becomes the new champion. He speaks with him and finds out Erhard's hometown had been raised during the war, and some time later he joined a group of mercenaries and became a spy in Hornburg. He blamed the king for what happened to his town. Gustav wonders if Erhard felt at ease after seeking this justice and revenge. No matter Erhard's sins, he taught Gustav the way of the sword, and he was proud to call him a brother, as, as was, was Ulbrich. He tells Ulbrich he can find Erhard in Wellspring, so he begins his journey there. His chapter 3 picks up the story a bit more as he learns Erhard is seen as a hero in Wellspring, protecting the people from the desert lizardmen. He wonders if Erhard has found new purpose, and already done more than he's managed to do. A lizardman Trust. raid threatens the town, so he joins the town guard in fighting off the horde. And once it becomes more manageable, he goes to help Erhard, who's currently fighting them off in the nest. They go to take out the leaders of the horde, and when Ulbrich goes to fight one, he sees that even the lizardmen have something to protect, while he doesn't. Except, he does. He thinks back to Philip and the people of Cobbleston, to Cecily and the tourney, to the people of this town he said he would protect. He does have something to protect. He couldn't protect his king and country, but as a wandering sword, he has found people who need him. He will protect the innocent, the weak, the kind. He won't fail. Not this time. Ulbrich defeats the Lizardmen and goes to talk to Erhard. He tells Erhard that he knows about his hometown being burnt to the ground, to which Erhard says he was glad to be picked up by the mercenaries as he no longer had a home. And when the leader of the group asked him to take down Hornburg, he was happy to do it. His town had believed the king would save them, and he hadn't. But once he killed the king, he didn't feel any more free. He was left with a cold, empty void where his anger had once been. He now regrets having lived in a lie for so many years in the name of vengeance. And yet, he still remembers those days as a knight, and cherishes the memory. And now he is in Wellspring. He's found people he can protect. Suddenly, Ulbrich is like, fight me, bro. And honestly, I was really confused at this part. And it felt like Ulbrich was confused, too. He says he can I end Erhard's suffering. So basically Ulbrich. saying he'd be happy to kill him. Sheesh, okay. But then talks about how he thought he'd lost his worth after that day in Hornburg, but that he's found it again just as Erhard has in protecting people. Hey, that's awesome. We love to see this growth. But then he also says he should have bested Erhard the day the king fell and saved him as well as the country. For men like them, the only option is to fight. And so he duels Erhard. He goes from wanting to kill this guy to explaining his emotional journey back to wanting to 
both kill and save Erhard? The reason this was confusing is because he doesn't end up killing him. They end their duel with Erhard yielding. There's this awkward silence, and then Ulbrick out of the blue asks who the mercenary leader for that group was. He plotted the entire downfall of a kingdom, so this man is obviously too dangerous to be left alive. Erhard says his name is Werner, and last he knew, he'd set out for Riverford. And that's about it. He says he and Erhard may meet again and sets out for Riverford with his new cause. So, are you guys friends again? Like, I'm really confused. This is one of the few times where the storyline in this game seemed confusing. I've tried to make sense of their interaction, and this is the best I've come up with. I've never been one to like the warrior characters, so maybe there's something about the manly urge to duel your best friend turned enemy turned kind of friend again that I just don't really understand. But from what I could tell, Ulbrich felt conflicted. He couldn't justify or forgive Erhard for what he'd done, and yet he understood why he had done it. However, that didn't change the fact that he had this pain and anger built up inside of him. So during the duel, he was able to let out that anger and emotion and find some peace. So clashing swords with someone helped him physically deal with the emotion? I don't know, either way he instead found fault in Werner as the true cause for what happened to Hornberg. This leads us to Riverford, where Werner has become the tyrannical lord of the town. And by tyrannical, I mean pure evil, as this guy is legit <laughs> burning people at the stake. Yeah, I'm starting to see why this guy should die. Ulbrich works with the local resistance to take him down, which kind of backfires as Werner had already figured out their plan. But Erhard shows up at the last minute to help, because he's obviously got to come in with that style, you know? Erhard helps the resistance while Ulbrich goes to face Werner. The lead up to the boss fight was really cool. Is this the fourth time I've used that phrase in talking about a chapter 4 boss? Maybe, but it's because it really is cool! Ulbrich explains that he intends to protect the innocent who need protecting, for protect protecting someone so is to see their future and potential. What an epic line, and such a cool way to look at things. It reminded me of Alfin and his philosophy that every life is worth saving. At the end of the fight, Werner says something really interesting. <laughs> the gate. The gate of Finnis. And then he- oh, yep, he does that, okay then. Alright, the Gate of Finnis pops up again. As I played through the game, this was the second story I finished. So I got Alfin's beautiful story and then this mystery all of a sudden. All I knew was there must be more post-game content, since there's no reason to mention this for nothing. But from Therion's story, it would seem this gate is definitely important, and it connects to more than just one of the stories. But before moving on, I'd like to say that, in the end, I did enjoy Ulbrich's story. Despite him being the warrior character, I'm sorry, I've just never liked them up until now for whatever reason. I was surprised to find that I I could find connection in his story, in his theme, finding purpose, similar to Alfin, where he had to rediscover his purpose after having a crisis of faith, like Primrose, and similar to Therion, who had to discover that it's okay to trust people. I'm definitely nitpicking the cool things that I personally found from these stories. Maybe their themes don't overlap as much as I'm suggesting, or maybe they do even more so. They are separate stories in their own right, but I found it beautiful to see that these characters could be as similar as they were different. I'm impressed at how personal and profound these stories are turning out to be. These are important topics, and I hadn't expected to find such comfort and hope from a video game. But that's the beautiful thing about Octopath. It's so real and relatable. Or if it isn't now, it's sure to be in the future. On top of cool gameplay and mechanics, and overall just being a great game, it's the ultimate combination. You will probably find it relatable for different reasons depending on what you're currently going through in life, in your personal journey. But more on that later. Next, I'd like to talk about Tressa. Tressa is a merchant, and she's only known the merchant's life for as long as she can remember. She's got an eye for good merchandise and really knows her craft, but she longs to see the world. She meets the captain of a merchant ship one day, Leon, as she goes about setting up shop. About this time, pirates come and steal stuff from the merchant stalls, and Tressa refuses to let them get away with it. After purchasing a sleeping draw off Leon, she mixes it with wine and gives it to the pirates. She sneaks into their hideout to get back the stolen goods. But uh-oh, the pirates wake up. Leon comes to her rescue That's and turns enough. out he's Leon Bastral, a famous pirate. Though he's given up that life to become a merchant. I'd never heard of a pirate turned merchant before, so I found this part of the story pretty interesting. After settling things with the pirates, they head back and Leon lets Tressa take one treasure from his ship. She chooses a journal from someone that had traveled the continent. Someone had left it on Leon's ship and he had almost tossed it. But using the journal as a guide, Tressa heads out to follow the traveler's footsteps and prove herself as a traveling merchant. The first place she finds herself is in Quarry Crest, a mining town, and she checks her journal to see where she should go. The author wrote about journeys as an opportunity, and that the greatest of these opportunities is to make a connection with someone new. It allows you to learn about others, as well as yourself. 
Very interesting, and it seems the author also wrote about this town having gold in it, and he was right. Tressa wonders if she might make a profit selling gold, but then this rather extravagant guy named Mr. Morlock comes along. He owns the land around here, so he also owns the gold, but he's willing to buy the gold off of people who find it. So selling gold is out of the question, time to find something else to trade in. She spots some rocks that this guy has dug up. For some reason, she thinks they're valuable, so she buys them off him. After polishing them, she finds they are beautiful gems, and this other traveling merchant, Ali, says they are the rare sky stone. Tressa goes into town to sell the stones and finds great success, so she goes back for more. But this time around, Ali comes along and steals all her customers. You can be the proud owner of these lovely gems for just a fraction of her prices! What? Gotta love a good merchant <laughs> battle. But I won't go down without a fight! Two seconds later. Tressa admits he knows how to sell his wares, but admonishes him for using flattery and taking people's money, not selling people what they actually need. He shakes it off and just walks away, leaving Tressa more upset than ever, as well as a bit famished. Ali happens to get his dinner at the same time and offers her some food, knowing she's a little short on funds at the moment, but she refuses to take pity food from a rival. Man, she's serious about this whole thing. I don't care if they're my enemy, as long as it's not poisoned, I'd take free food any day. Here we learn a bit about Ali. Though, unlike previous chapters, his personal story doesn't relate to Tressa's as much, so I'm afraid I'll be glossing over it. Sorry to any Ali fans out there. Soon after this, Mr. Morlock and his guard Omar come along. Omar claims that since Mr. Morlock is the landowner here, he can oversee all business transactions, therefore making their Skystone trade illegal. So, I get the feeling Mr. Morlock is a big pushover who relies on Omar's muscle to get things done. And by things, I mean paying people one-tenth the price of the gold they dig up. I don't care if this guy owns the land, that's just unethical. This guy is too familiar with the idea of making a profit. Morlock has Omar beat up Ali, then he straight up takes the Sky Stones and saunters off. With Ali? Wait, isn't that kidnapping or abduction? Whoa, 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 these guys were jerk faces, but actual criminals? Yikes. So of course, Tressa goes to save him. Morlock is sitting fancy in his manor counting his riches, which is interesting since he's already filthy rich. It's like this guy has bound his happiness to his money. Even though he has enough to retire two times over, he has to get more in order to increase his happiness. Pretty sad, honestly. <laughs> There's nothing that money can't buy. He's even willing to go as far as selling Ali in order to make money. Now that's really messed up. Tressa gives this killer line. Your coffers may be overflowing, but you're still morally bankrupt. And then she beats up Omar. And of course, Morlock is useless without his muscles, so he just skips town. That's one way to get rid of a tyrant. And Tressa's gonna find someone new to run the town. Eh, works for me. Having the visiting 18-year-old merchant choose your new government official is a great way to solve any local political drama. Ali is now safe, and he says he owes her. He mentions that there is a merchant's fair in Grandport, and they decide they'll meet there. Tressa reflects on the author's words about finding a connection with someone new, as she heads off to find a treasure worth selling at the fair. This leads her to Victor's Hollow for Chapter 3. In this chapter, she comes across a map that belonged to Leon's best friend, the pirate Baltazar. This merchant had found it in an old storehouse and nearly thrown it out. And then the second he finds out it's from a famous pirate, he refuses to sell it to her. Great. Leon ends up being in town, as he's come to visit Baltazar's hometown to pay homage to him. He passed away about this time of year. Tressa takes Leon to confirm if the map is real, which it is. The merchant gets all high and mighty again, saying he'll only trade the map for a super rare shield that another merchant in town has, to which Leon says the map isn't his to take. Tressa won't have this, so we go on a journey to get the shield and then the map in turn. Leon explains that the map leads to Baltazar's Eldred. rarest gemstone, Eldrite, the only one of its kind. He had made a deal to race Baltazar in a storm to win the stone. Baltazar won, though it cost him his life. So Leon feels he doesn't have a right to the stone, and that's why he let the map go. He tells Tressa the map belongs to her now, and she decides to follow it and find the Eldrite. One sea cove and a saber-toothed tiger battle later, and we got the stone. Why is this tiger in a sea cave, though? Now that I think about that, that's honestly really random. There's a letter with the stone, which Tressa gives to Leon and it simply says, Did you find what's most precious to you? After Baltazar's death, Leon had realized his pirating ways had given him nothing. He had gold and gems, but he had nothing that was truly precious to him. He had nothing he was willing to give his life for. So he decided to pursue his friend's dream instead, fixed up his ship and became a merchant. Leon gives the stone to Tressa, saying the letter is the only thing he needs as the stone means nothing to him. There's only room in one's heart for a truly precious treasure, and he found his in his friend's ship. Tressa says she hasn't found her precious treasure yet, but she will someday. With that, she heads to the merchant's fair. 
Eldrite in hand. You'd think chapter 3 ends there, but suddenly a hooded figure appears, unnamed, and begins following her. This guy looked suspiciously like one of the crows. The reason I came to this conclusion was most likely because of the order I did the chapters, doing the chapter 1s, then chapter 2s, etc. So slowly unraveling everyone's story made it really interesting to watch, especially as this hooded figure started following her very suspicious. And this leads into her chapter 4. This chapter involves a wealthy family by the name Winham at the Merchant's Fair. The father is looking for a perfect gift for his daughter, Noah. They do this every year, apparently. As Tressa goes through town, the hooded figure reveals themselves, and ends up being this weird lady that straight up takes Tressa's journal from her, and is like, mine now? Excuse me, who are you? I'll be honest, that was still really unclear all the way after I defeated her as the final boss. What? Just like Ulbrich's chapter 3, this was another really confusing moment. As I went through the dungeon for this chapter, I was having to fight Obsidian and lackeys, so I assume this lady is related to the crows and their organization from Prim's chapters. And until I got to the end of the game, that was all I had. Apparently she wanted the journal in order to find something, but the journal ended Ugh. up being useless. Okay. At this point, I was thinking Tressa's story didn't really have a point and was rather disconnected even from itself, but thankfully the story took a turn. She gets back from getting her journal and now she has to present her item to the Winhams as a possible gift. But instead of doing the Eldrite, she presents her journal. She knows Noah wishes to travel the world, but can't due to health issues. She says the greatest treasure she found was the journey itself and the people she met along the way, and she hopes Noah would find as much joy and purpose from the journal as she did. Noah's dad decides to take the journal, and Tressa tells him to keep the money and she'll cash it another day. A sweet message, even if the rest of the story seems strange. I personally didn't connect to Tressa's story as much, and I think it's because I've seen the joys in the journey as a trope way too often. It's not a bad thing. The idea that the greatest treasures are your relationships with people and your experiences in life is a really powerful message and one that I actually find very important, but it's something I figured out pretty early in life. So even though I enjoyed her story, it wasn't as much of an aha moment as the others. I do like Tressa as a character. She's this little ball of sunshine with boundless energy, and I love her to pieces. Her story is really solid and a fun adventure, but this chapter still felt strange to me. I was wondering about this when a guy walks up to Tressa and is like, that journal. I gave it to someone years ago and told him to fill it with his travels. His name was... Graham Crossford? Wait, the guy that saved Alfin is the guy that wrote this journal and led Tressa to have this adventure? Ah, oh, wait, so Alfin and Tressa's stories connect, Therion and Ulbricks do, and so far Primrose is somewhat connects to Tressa's? Okay, interesting. Tressa's story was the third one I finished, so this was truly the first time I saw any chance of a connection between the stories. Up to this point, I had already been impressed with the game, thinking its message was one of journeys, that we are all on a journey. And even though our adventures may be big, like Prim, or small, more like Tressa or Alphans, they are meaningful and important, because it's important to you. This was what I thought the theme of the game was, and I had fully planned on seeing each story end and that to be it. But it isn't just about the individual journey, because the journeys of these eight individuals that started so far from each other seem to be reaching a closer end. I was way too curious to see where this went. Next, we'll talk about Hannah, a skilled huntress from the Darkwood who talks like Shakespeare if he was from the 90s. I can't tell if I should translate what she's saying when I read it or just go with it and try to accept the Shakespearean horror of a dialect. But yes, her story revolves around her master Zonta, who has practically raised her since she was a child, as her parents died when she was young. Zonta had been asked by Eliza from the Knights Ardant, the Knights from the Church of the Flame, which we'll see in Ophelia's chapters, with tracking down a beast named Red Eye. No one has been able to catch it so far, but he has no worries as he is known as the best hunter in the realm. And and indeed he is, but Hannah is worried as Zonta has been known to gamble and drink in excessive amounts. It has been a year now, and in that time he has only sent her one letter, saying he is tracking the beast and heading towards Stoneguard. She is worried, but sets herself to working as a distraction. After fighting a beast in the woods that had attacked some merchants, Hagen, Zonta's direwolf companion, comes running into town, but Zonta is not with him. Hannah knows something is very wrong now. There's no way the hunt could have ended that badly, so she heads off in search of her master. She heads to Stoneguard, as that's the only clue she has. Right off, we see her talking to Hagen and Lind, and I love seeing how Hanet has a way with beasts. She understands them, and it's said that the people of the dark would have this ability. They can read the hearts of beasts, which is not only cool lore-wise, but is also important in seeing how kind and compassionate she is. She's a hunter, she may kill beasts, but she does so with respect as she understands nature and its delicate balance. This was especially shown in her chapter one, but thought I'd mention it here. She goes to the alehouse, and sure enough, Zanta's been there, but not for some time. She learns of a woman in town, he 
had been visiting named Natalia, and so she goes to find her. This pompish noble dude is I acting like a needy tryhard trying to get Natalia to go out with him or something, so we save her from the sky and go to her house to talk. We learned that her husband and Zanta had been friends, though her husband passed away recently. Zanta had made sure to check in with her and make sure she was alright, but then he just disappeared. Last she knew, he had gone to the woods outside town about three months ago. There's some sweet dialogue where we get to see how much Hana cares for Zanta, as he's like the father she never had. But with that, she goes to the forest. I fight this terrifying tree monster, which I imagine is the horror version of the Wispy Woods from Kirby, as well as the chapter boss, the Lord of the Forest, which looks like what would happen if the guy's vengeance set for Valorant and the forest spirit from Princess Mononoke had a baby. It also reminds me of a really shaggy dog. But enough comparisons. I beat the deer thing and Hanit follows a trail and ends up finding her master, turned to stone. It appears he fired a final arrow with a note on it, in which he says Red Eye turned him to stone. He writes that there is a seer named Susanna in Still Snow, and that she may know how to remove the curse. He says if Hana is reading this, then he is sorry for not keeping his promise to return. Hagen stays with Zanta to watch over him until Hana returns. This was really sweet. What a reliable companion. Hagen MVP for real for real. Hana tells Natalia and Eliza, who turns up in town looking for Zanta God, as well, of what has happened. And Eliza says she will begin the search for Red Eye while Hana goes to Still Snow, and with that, she takes her leave. In Still Snow, she finds that Susanna is a famous seer who has people from all over the realm coming to her. But she doesn't take many customers and has a bodyguard to turn people away. I take him out and then Susanna appears telling Hanit to come inside. She is no fortune teller, but she is knowledgeable and observant. As they talk, I love this moment where Susanna says Zanta raised Hanit to be a strong and brave young woman. And Hanit says she learned from Zanta not only in his good examples, but in his bad. She saw his faults, she acknowledged his mistakes, and perhaps her own, and took it as a chance to learn. And she doesn't think any less of him for it. In chapter Chapter 2, we saw that he is her teacher, her master, but he is also like a father to her, and she loves him. I really liked this. It can be hard not to put people on a pedestal, or when we love someone to ignore their flaws and see them as perfect. But when we do this, we run the danger of not only creating a person in our head who doesn't exist, but being let down when they don't meet our expectations. We might even dismiss harmful behavior. I found Hannah's view of her master, how she learned from both the good and the bad about him, to be a really healthy one. Thanks for the lesson, Hannah. Susanna says Hanit must slay Red Eye. Only then will the petrification be reversed. And while that may be difficult, she can give Hana an advantage. In the forest to the north, there is a plant called Herb of Grace. It prevents the effects of petrification, so Hana goes to retrieve it. The only eventful things to happen after this are one, it somehow took me this long to realize that the water in this game is not pixel art, and two, when I came to fight the boss, I was like, whoa, dragon, and my cousin's like, yeah, you should look at its name. And I'm like, ooh, it's probably some winter wyvern or something epic like that. Its name is Dragon. Yep. Really? I thought it would have a cool name when I went to fight it, but I was disappointed to see it was just Dragon. And you decided I should also experience this disappointment? Yep. Well, isn't that nice? But this fight is cool, as Hannah has heard from Zanta his tales of hunting dragons, and now she has her own tale to tell. But let me tell thee this, Hanit. What is it, Master? Even when thy tale is so improbable and fantastic that not one man thinketh it the truth, thou canst tell in it to me, and I will believe every word. Susanna brews the herb so it'll work properly. Then, as Hannah exits town, a knight from the Knights Ardant tells Hannah that Red Eye has been found in Marcelum. Guess it's hunting time. Once in Marcelum, Hanit learns that Red Eye is in the ruins to the west. The Grimsand Ruins, honestly, one of my favorite dungeons in the game. It's this entire lost civilization, and it intrigues me so much. A small regiment went into the sands to drive off other monsters, but when they returned, we learned they had gone after Red Eye as well and were all nearly killed. They go to discuss with the Keen, and Hanit says she will go in alone. Can you defeat it? I swear on my life. I will bring the beast down and free your men from its baleful curse. So I get in there to fight this thing and oh my gosh, what demon spawn is this? Mm. This thing is mad ugly. Like mad ugly. I do not understand. This creature's heart, I cannot read it. I can sense the feelings of every beast, every monster, but from this one, nothing. And it only gets worse in the actual fight. This thing looks like a weird mix between No Face and the demon from Princess Mononoke. I swear, I've only watched Princess Mononoke once, but am I wrong in these comparisons, though? Where the heck did you come from, sir? 
This fight took me a few tries, but in the end, I never once had to use the Herb of Grace. I don't know how Red Eye never used his petrification in all four or five times I tried to fight it, but I guess he didn't see Hannah as enough of a threat to expend energy to petrify her. Think again, you fiend! Defeating Red Eye breaks the curse. Hannah is now a hero in Marcelum, and she returns to Stone Guard to find Zanta alive and well. Their reunion was really sweet, and this ending left me thinking two things. One, how on earth does Red Eye fit into the story? It seems so random. There was nothing that obviously connected it to everyone else. It left the story feeling out of place, as if it were some wild card waiting to reveal itself. But two, I realized what one of the messages is for her story. She had made her own way in the world. She had slain the dragons, something few hunters had ever done. And more than that, she slew Red Eye, a beast no other hunter could slay. She now has two stories of her own to tell, and has proven herself a brave and skilled hunter in her own right. She was no longer just Zanta's apprentice, but had become a hunter of her own. She had become her own person, and that was really cool. There's a traveler's banter, mini chat sessions that can occur outside the main story stories, where Alfin and Hanit talk about becoming better than their masters, and it was cool to see that Hanit did that. You don't have to aim to be as good as someone. You can be better become better. And I really liked that as a theme. You can come to shine on your own in whatever you do. You don't always have to follow someone else's footsteps. Sometimes you forge your own path. That's how some of the greatest advances in history came about. And the cool thing is, you don't have to do it on your own. Sometimes you can do it right beside someone else, backing each other and helping each other become better. As I reviewed her story, I also came to appreciate how strong of a character Hannah is, and how she comes to be sure of herself, which I find to be an interesting contrast to Ophelia. Starting in her chapter one, she is a little unsure of herself. She she is a cleric from the Church of the Sacred Flame and is the adopted daughter of the Archbishop, the leader of the church. Her family died when she was young, and now many years later she is helping her sister Liana prepare to perform the kindling, a sacred rite performed every 20 years. The tale goes that after the twelve gods sealed away the dark god Galdera, one of the deities Alfric set down a flame to give light to mortals. This original flame still burns in the Cave of Origin, and every 20 years the kindling is performed, where a member of the church takes an ember from the original flame and relights the flame in churches across the realm. In talking to Ophelia's father, we see that she she never refers to him as her father, always calling him your excellency, which is rather odd. She may be adopted, but he is still her father, and it made me think that she still struggles to accept herself as a member of the family. She feels like an outsider, though she loves them very much. Ophelia is talking to this merchant, Matthias, about getting supplies for Liana's journey, when a cleric comes to tell Ophelia her father has collapsed. She rushes to his side to see Liana already there. He is rather weak, but he tells Liana she must perform the kindling no matter what. Then he drifts into sleep. Liana leaves to get some air, and Ophelia goes to find her. Liana is really scared. She's afraid her father may die while she is gone, but Ophelia says they will we find a way together. together. There is a flashback where Ophelia had been closed off and in despair upon coming to the Archbishop's home, and Liana was the one to help her come out of that. Ophelia decides to go to the Cave of Origin in Liana's stead, meaning she will go on the pilgrimage in her place. Though it breaks tradition, and she may be punished for it, she decides to do it anyway, so her sister may stay by their father's side. After fighting the Guardian of the Flame to prove she's worthy, she's able to obtain the Empire. The Archbishop is upset by this, but nothing can be done. Ophelia must perform the kindling now. After preparing, she sets out to Saint's Bridge, where the first cathedral on her journey resides. Ophelia's chapter in Saint's Bridge is really sweet, and becomes one of my favorite side stories post-game. But in the grand scheme of her story, it isn't that consequential. She lights the flame in the cathedral and saves a boy from some wolves in the forest. She also helps him with his friendship with some other boys in town. This chapter does two really cool things. One, it tackles the topic of friendship, particularly in the younger children, as well as the topic of loss, as one of the boys has lost his mother. The anger and sadness he feels over this, he's been bottling up, and it's been resurfacing when he lashes out at his friends. Considering Ophelia has also dealt with the loss of her family at a young age, I don't think there could have been a better person to help these boys. Again, it's not consequential to the main story, but I really appreciated the themes represented in this chapter. The second thing this chapter did was solidify Ophelia as a kind and caring person. She is always willing to serve others and puts them before herself. She is sweet and gentle, courageous and caring. The bishop of this cathedral says that the flame brought by the flame bearer reflects their heart, and that this flame is warm and gentle. She's very aware of others and their feelings, and this chapter really solidifies that, as does her chapter 3. She arrives in Goldshore, once again meeting Matthias, the merchant who had helped her sister prepare for the kindling. He mentions that there is famine, poverty, and war among other afflictions tainting the land at the moment, and that many people seem to be leaving the church over these things. He apologizes for burdening Ophelia with this and says she should be focusing herself on the kindling. She goes to the bishop to perform the kindling in their cathedral, but notices that something is off with the bishop. Eventually, we find out someone has kidnapped his daughter, and he can only get her back if he takes the ember from the flame bearer and brings it to the kidnappers in a cavern nearby. Ophelia goes to save his daughter, but on the way through town, 
runs into Matthias again, where they have another conversation about the state of the world, faith, and things of that nature. Weird, but I guess the man just needs someone to talk to. Soon, she's on her way to the cave. Ophelia wonders why anyone would want the flame, and after beating the kidnappers, she finds out why. They seem to serve someone called the Savior, and he wanted the Ember. She is unable to find out more as the last remaining kidnapper drinks poison and collapses. Ophelia returns to the cathedral and performs the kindling at last. All that is left is to return to Flame's Grace and light the flame there, and the kindling will be complete. But as she is leaving the cathedral, Liana walks Ophelia. in. They go to a local inn to talk, and Ophelia finds out their father has passed. Ophelia goes to comfort Liana when her legs give out suddenly. Liana thanks her, and says Thank she'll you, understand as this is for their father. Ophelia collapses, and Liana takes the ember. Whoa. A man walks in, and Liana can asks if he can truly bring, bring her father, father back, back, which the man says he can. The savior. He talks of how the church did nothing when her father died, and how he can offer her more and make her wishes come true. And then they leave for Whispermill. Once Ophelia wakes from the sleeping draw, she remembers what happened, and the bishop tells her of rumors of people leaving the church and following a man called the Savior in that area. Concerned for her sister, she leaves for Whispermill to find out what happened. Go to chapter 4 and Ophelia gets locked up when she gets to the town. Seems the Savior has a pretty tight hold on this place. She wakes up in prison to find Matthias there the savior. After a lovely little chat, where Matthias reveals his plan to weaken the flame of Alfric and bring back a bit of Galdera's power for himself, he leaves. Ophelia is forced to wait, and eventually Liana comes to break Ophelia out, apologizing but saying she will still help Matthias with his ritual. She I wants their like father back. Uh huh. Things never go well when you are trying to defy death. We get to the cavern where these cultists are, and they are already trying to summon the Dark God's power. That can't be good. Matthias is using Liana's desire to have her father back to turn the flame dark, and the townspeople are sacrifices for Galdera. The flame reflects the heart of the flame bearer, and Liana's desire to revive the dead has made the flame dark as the afterworld. The power the twelve gods sealed away was the power over life and death, and for every life given, the power of Galdera grows. This is some seriously messed up stuff. Ophelia comes in and takes out the henchman, facing Matthias. He says the ritual can't be stopped unless Liana gives up her desire, and since she won't, Ophelia has no choice but to kill her sister. But Ophelia knows better. She thinks of what the archbishop would have said. Would you give me your excellency? Her father. Father! And then she remembers That's something. It. Liana, don't you remember the bird? Remember, Liana. Remember father's words. As children, they had found a dead bird. They wanted their father to bring it back to life, but he explained that once a living creature has died, it cannot return to this world. Liana says that is cruel of the gods, but the archbishop says that in exchange for this, they were given the joy of life. The joy of life? But what's so good about life if we all just die in the end? All things that live must one day pass through those solemn gates. But it is because we know that our time is limited that we know to enjoy each day that we have. Life is filled with joy and happy moments if we choose to see them. And even when someone dies, that does not mean they are entirely gone. They live on in their memories, in the hearts of those who love them. Time softens the sharp edges of grief. And those you have lost live on in your heart. So long as you do not forget them. Someday, I too will pass through those gates. It is inevitable. But when that day comes, pray remember me, that I might live on forever in your hearts. As Liana remembers the flame weakens, returning to its soft blue hue, <gasps> Matthias is taken aback, and Ophelia has some business with him for messing with her sister. Like Therion's chapter 4, there were bits of dialogue that triggered during the fight. It was mostly a battle of principles, but we get a really cool line at the end from Ophelia. I was once saved by her kindness. And her love. She pulled me out of the darkness I had shut myself away in. This time, I will save her. I will not lose to you. You are a nuisance and nothing more. Disappear from me. Once, Liana will have nothing left to cling to but Galdera and her savior. <laughs> Thrill of the fight. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the power of unconditional love. Matthias has been defeated, by love no less, something he thought he could do without. A sad man indeed. 
What struck me about the following events was Ophelia's attitude towards Liana. She did not blame her, and even if she had, she very quickly forgave her. She knew why Liana had done what she did, and Ophelia simply chose to love. The villagers awaken, and they all return to town, and eventually flames Grace to complete the kindling. After the events in Whisper Mill, Liana is struggling. She is not eating and refuses company, but Ophelia is determined to help her. She takes Liana to their spot on the cliff, the place Liana had taken Ophelia many years ago to cheer her up. To see a character like Ophelia, who was lost in so much grief and saved by her new sister, to come out of that and find happiness, and then help her sister in turn when she too found herself in grief. To say this story didn't affect me would be a great lie. As Alpin's story did, Ophelia's taught me of the joy of life, as well as the joy in loving another. That even when we are in our darkest moments, those closest to us can help guide us back to light. That darkness is but for a season. And though it is hard, really, really hard, it is not something we have to bear on our own. Sometimes we need help and sometimes we're the ones in a position to help. Ophelia's story taught me about grief. You could say it's cheesy, the idea that people live on in our memories, but if you were to call that cheesy, then I suppose so is love, romance, happiness, sadness, and life in general. Ophelia's story had me realize an important truth. Why should I despair over the death of another? when they would want so much better for me. Being sad is normal. We are meant to be sad, to grieve and mourn the loss of someone or something loved and cherished. But that isn't the end. Life continues, and in times of grief, it's important to remember that. In the end, Liana returns to Whisper Mill. She finds purpose in helping the people there, finding healing and helping the people she feels she wronged. Something I still wonder about is how Ophelia's story relates to the others, as well as why Ophelia and Therion's Chapter 4s had dialogue during the boss fight. But I had little time to reflect on that, as we still have my boy Cyrus to talk about. Prepare yourselves for the final chapters of this story. Oh, Cyrus. Oh man, Cyrus, he's got a special place in my heart. Because not only is he a cool wizard who has immense knowledge and power, but he also manages to be so incredibly dumb that you can't help but laugh. So let me set the stage. Cyrus is a scholar and professor with a true passion for his work. He tutors the Princess Mary and her distant relative, Therese. One day he enters the royal archives to find a particular book, only to find it missing. He's interrupted by the headmaster, Yvonne, who has these creepy little red eyes, calling him to his office. Yvonne admonishes him for having published an article using one of the archive books as a reference. Yvonne claims only those worthy should have that knowledge, but Cyrus disagrees and thinks knowledge is meant for all and not the few. Getting back to his missing book, he uses his deduction skills to discover that one of his colleagues, Russell, stole the book to pay off some gambling debts. That nice. Mystery correct. solved through the power of knowledge. But for all his knowledge, he knows nothing about women. And this gets him in trouble when Therese, who has a bit of a crush on him, tries to get his attention by accusing him of being too friendly with the princess. Don't ask me why she thought this was a good idea. And of course, in true Cyrus fashion, he completely misunderstands this as Therese feeling neglected by her tutor. My studies. Poor Therese. This whole event ends with him taking a break from teaching as to save face for both him and the princess. But hey, no biggie, because there's this other book called From the Far Reaches of Hell that went missing 15 years ago from the same archive. Guess I'll find that in the meantime. Oh Cyrus, you poor intelligent man. The last thing to happen in the chapter occurs as Cyrus leaves the capital. There's a black cloaked figure who begins following him, just like Tress's chapter 3. Again, I thought this might be the Obsidians, but only time would tell. The theme of Cyrus's failure of romance follows him into chapter 2, which to me was the most hilarious and dark chapter in the game. I'm not sure how they managed to do that, since it started so differently from how it ended. Cyrus enters the town of Quarry Crest looking for his old colleague, Odette, who might know about the tome he's looking for, from the far reaches of hell. An ominous title, to be sure. He doesn't remember where she lives, so he goes to look at this letter, and you'd assume it's gonna give him instructions to the house, right? Wrong. The entire thing is Odette warning him that he's a handsome guy and needs to be more careful. Apparently, he very often gives the wrong impression towards the ladies. She says it's gonna get him in trouble, so he'd better be careful. Thing is, this letter was from 10 years ago. I'm reading this letter, and I'm dying. And would you look at that? He's now lost his job because of this. Oh, brother. He's like, oop, shouldn't have read that, and keeps walking as these two girls walk him go by and giggle. <laughs> Bruh. But it gets better, because then we get two travelers banters. But I'll only be talking about one. It's with Ophelia. And by the way, this isn't the first time this has happened. Homegirl seems to have won the hearts of all the men in the group. I know how the poor girl keeps getting herself into these situations. Ophelia asks the professor what the letter was, as he seemed engrossed in it, and he just flat out says, oh, it was warning me about women. Oh, but not in a bad way. Just that I come off the wrong way sometimes and need to be careful about how I speak to women. Oh, well, I mean, that makes sense. After all, women can find intelligence like yours attractive. Oh, please. The word attractive should be saved for something truly deserving of it. Like a young lady such as yourself. 
Yeah, I think that's what the letter was talking about. What? Can I not tell a woman she is beautiful if I really do think so? Yes, but maybe you shouldn't? Cyrus, my guy, how? Surely this has happened too many times to count, based off the fact your colleague literally had to warn you about it. I don't know, man, I guess even great scholars have things to learn. But the thing that shocked me in this chapter was how dark it turned after this. It went from Cyrus being inept at flirting to this guy who's been kidnapping townspeople to make blood crystals for some dark magic. This guy had a copy of From the Far Reaches of Hell, though some things seem to be omitted from the book. A piece of parchment between the pages says one specimen has already been delivered, so it looks like someone commissioned this stone to be made. But even with this fairly dark turn, it wouldn't be right if the chapter ended without Cyrus getting into more trouble, as one of the victims, a young woman, awakens and is met with Cyrus, who was apparently too much of a gentleman for his own good. Odette had been researching the tome while Cyrus solved the mystery of the missing townspeople, so he returns to her and together they examine the copy of From the Far Reaches of Hell. Based on the leather that binds it, Cyrus and Odette find that the book must have been bound in Stoneguard. As he goes to leave, Odette asks if the book had been stolen 15 years ago, and when Cyrus confirms it, she tells him that the headmaster at the time had died that very same year, meaning there could be some connection between the book's disappearance okay. and the headmaster's yeah. death. Cyrus then leaves for Stoneguard, only for the hooded figure to step forward and follow Cyrus. Upon arriving in Stoneguard, he's still being followed as he heads to the bindery for info. There, he learns of a translator named Dominic, who lives on the edge of town. When he reaches the house, the guy Big turns Dominic. Cyrus away before he even opens the door. So Cyrus decides to learn more about him to see if he can get in his good graces. By scrutinizing people in town, Cyrus finds that 15 years ago, he lost his only daughter to sickness. He had been too poor to afford medicine, and accepted a translation commission that paid well, though he apparently regrets it. With this knowledge, he returns to Dominic's home. Using some deduction, Cyrus comes to the conclusion that the book Dominic was given to translate was from the far reaches of hell. And when he presents this theory to Dominic, along with his own mission to not allow knowledge to be used for evil, Dominic invites him in. He doesn't remember the name of the man who commissioned the book, but he remembers the man's blood red eyes, Yvonne. Dominic didn't hesitate to accept the job, as he had no other way to get medicine for his daughter. He translated it, fearing what would happen if that dreadful book came into the wrong hands. In the end, his daughter died and he saw his divine punishment for the sin of translating that book. Cyrus promises to not allow the book to be used for evil, and he wishes it might bring a little rest to Dominic's soul. As he leaves the house, the hooded figure is there, and he Come asks now. if they will continue hiding or if they'll reveal themselves. Turns out to be Yvonne's assistant, Lucia. She apologizes for following Cyrus, and says she suspects the headmaster to be plotting something with the book Cyrus is looking for. She says she couldn't just sit by while their profession was sullied by Yvonne using knowledge for evil. She reveals that Yvonne is from Stoneguard, so they go to search the house he was born in. A perfectly creepy an abandoned house at that. Makes me wonder if something bad will happen and... Oh, well, what do you know? Cyrus is now in this hole, and Yvonne is standing there like, I knew you'd come here eventually. Like the bad guys always do. Looks like Lucia was sent to keep an eye on him, not to seek help. Yvonne offers Cyrus a way out if he'll become his apprentice, to which Cyrus hits him with, How kind of you. I refuse. I am, shall we say, philosophically opposed to your stance on knowledge. I believe that knowledge should be shared, not hoarded for one's personal gain. Man, intellectual humor is so incredibly entertaining, and I don't mean that ironically. This is comedy gold. Yvonne leaves him to starve, and Cyrus tries to find a way out. He can find none, however, and we are forced to wait. Eventually something happens. A rope is thrown down and he climbs out. It's Therese. She knew Cyrus was in danger and came to warn him. At this point, Yvonne full on body slams Cyrus out of the way and takes Therese hostage. And then he just magic poofs out of there. Sir? We go through the cellar to find Therese tied up and Yvonne saying he's gonna kill her because she found out his secrets. Yeesh. Oh, uh, okay. I guess we're just using blood crystals to transform into a hulkish nightmare now. After defeating Yvonne, he mutters stuff about being immortal and having been lied to before he poofs into non-existence. Cyrus gets Therese out of there, and once she's recovered some, she tells him what she had overheard. It was the headmaster and some other voice talking about seeing him dead, and so she came to warn him. Cyrus thanks her, but also asks that she consult someone in the future before doing something so dangerous. She begins to say something more before Cyrus says he'll continue his journey and make sure to send her letters with homework to keep her mind sharp. Cyrus, this is really... Like, really not the time for this. Therese is flustered, but at Cyrus's confusion, lets it go. Before he leaves, she tells him one last thing. Yvonne said after he killed Cyrus, he would head to Duskborrow. And Thank with you, that knowledge Therese. at hand, Cyrus heads off to face whatever evil he may find there. Something I appreciated about this chapter was a bit of a monologue from Cyrus at the end. He talks about how he and the headmaster are not so different, both thirsting for knowledge nearly to the point of obsession. The difference, however, lies in their philosophies on knowledge and its use. Yvonne used his position as headmaster to hoard knowledge for his personal gain and power, which included evil nefarious 
nefarious things, and Cyrus couldn't let that slide. Knowledge is for everyone, not for the few. Something inherited from our ancestors. Always remember this, Therese. Knowledge is a bounty to be shared by all. The more of us that possess true knowledge, the richer we all become. Those who seek knowledge must never forget this. That is what I believe. I'll refrain from commenting on this for now, as this will come up again as we go into the final chapter, but I found Cyrus's thoughts insightful, and even appreciated how self-aware of a character he is to comment of his own accord about the similarities between himself and the headmaster. Very scholarly of him, and I thought I would include it. In Duskborrow, Cyrus spots Lucia in the middle of town. He decides to follow her only for her to disappear once more. The only clue, a door of sorts with strange markings. Yeah. The game leads us through a series of options by which we puzzle our way to opening the door. I really liked this part and honestly would have loved to see more of this in his other chapters. We did, but it was more like remembering facts than actually solving a mystery. But I've been a fan of puzzles or mysteries for ages, so maybe that's just me. Entering through the door leads to a large landscape of ruins, the dungeon for this chapter. The dungeon came a lot quicker than many of the other stories, but this doesn't stop the chapter from being chocked full of interesting twists and turns. Right before you enter the second section of the dungeon, there is a wall with runes painted on it. The runes are High Hornbergian, and together the runes paint a picture. A gate. I was getting pretty excited. Yes, over a wall, I know, who am I? I did Cyrus' story third to last, so I knew of a Gate of Finnis vaguely from Ulberg's chapters, and I assumed this is what it portrayed. There also appears to be some creature in the gate, and it does seem similar to Red Eye, though at the time I thought it was a similar creature, or at the very least an evil creature considering we're chasing down a book about black magic from hell. As to the other stories, I wasn't sure. For anyone who has watched to this point but hasn't played the game, first of all, congratulations. I hope that means you found this game as fascinating as I do. And two, if you end up deciding to play the game, <laughs> you should. I think Cyrus's story is a great one to end with, as his story is what really begins tying the lore of this game together, as you'll see as we continue through the dungeon. The next section leads us to a substantial library, where Cyrus discovers books he thought lost to time or tomes he didn't even know existed. But Cyrus concludes that Yvonne couldn't have done this on his own. Such a vast collection must have been gathered over decades or even centuries. Cyrus continues his search, going through more ruins and bookshelves up to a grand stair case. If that doesn't bode a boss fight, I don't know what does. At the top there is a landing, a somehow floating island from all appearances, a wealth of knowledge beyond that of the previous room, and one soul. Lucia. Professor. To think you were the one pulling the strings. The headmaster was merely your puppet all along. Very astute. Yes, it was I who maneuvered to install him in that position in the first place. Wait, 15 years ago and... how old is this lady? I suppose it doesn't really matter either way, because Cyrus and Lucia get right into their battle of words, throwing in hypotheticals and talking all fancy, eventually leading to the main point, the original copy of From the Far Reaches of Hell. Except it doesn't, because Lucia mentions it and then it's like, you found me, showing you have a passion for finding the truth. Join me in my research. And I'm over here like, lady, what are you even researching? Because personally, from what I've seen, it looks like you're asking my boy Cyrus to join the dark side. And I'm not really keen on that considering your puppet Yvonne turned into a demon and perished. Cyrus thankfully agrees with my sentiment and Lucia fires right back. She asks if Cyrus doesn't want to know what the paintings are about, if her vast collection doesn't intrigue him. Together, we can unlock all the secrets behind our world. But Cyrus still I'll says no. Pass. She doesn't care who she uses to get her way. Yvonne a prime example of that. If she wanted to appear so badly, she should have taught him. Rather than a pawn, impart her vast knowledge to him as a student, that one day he might stand shoulder to shoulder with her. She basically calls Yvonne a nitwit and says mediocrity is as mediocrity does. But Cyrus still believes in mediocrity. As scholars, we learn from the past to better understand the present and pass our knowledge on to the future. What do you mean to do with the knowledge you amass? The secrets you unravel? Carry them to your grave, content they are inscrutable to all who do not possess your genius. You would call them simpletons, fools, feeble minds. I say it is you who lacks the ability to teach and inspire. Oh, heck yeah, you tell her, Cyrus. And he only continues spitting these bars. A true scholar does not look down on others for what they do or do not know. 
Those who know impart knowledge to those who do not. If something is wrong, those who know the answer correct it. The process repeats, bringing us closer and closer to enlightenment. I teach my students with the expectation that one day they will surpass me. I long for the day when I will have the chance to learn from them. And here we will take a quick pause to talk. I know I let that clip play out for a while, but I feel like what Cyrus said, combined with the delivery from the voice actor, did a much better job than I ever could trying to summarize it. As I've mentioned before, I played this game along with my cousin and brother. And my brother has mentioned to me that one of the things that impacted him most about this game is Cyrus's philosophy on knowledge. And while I think other stories had more impact for me personally, I can easily see why Cyrus made such a big impact on him. What Cyrus has described pretty closely resembles my own philosophy on knowledge and learning. That learning Learning is constant. Learning is life. And most importantly, learning is knowledge. It is not specific to academics. As great as the maths and sciences are, being smart should not be measured by the amount of calculus you can do. Being smart is having experience. It's having wisdom. It's about recovering from mistakes, coming to conclusions, knowing how to navigate life a little easier, and having the skills you need for a joyful and fulfilling life. I also love what Cyrus said about rejoicing in the day he will learn from his students. It reminded me of Hanit's journey to become a huntress of her own. It's so self-fulfilling and whole. It feels complete. We could progress so far in the world if we took the time to learn from each other, and to recognize that learning can come from anyone and anywhere. Learning is not restricted to a classroom. The thing I especially love about Cyrus's speech was his point that we should not mock someone for their knowledge or lack of it. I've seen this far too often, and am myself guilty of this. I constantly see people shamed for not knowing things that most people deem as common knowledge. Why would we judge someone like that? We don't know their background. We don't know why they do or don't know that thing. There's a quote I saw recently by a psychiatrist by the name of Carl Gustav Jung. Thinking is difficult. That's why most people judge. Why would we shame people when we could instead do as Cyrus says? What would happen if we were to gently correct, inform, teach those around us? Curiosity should be something celebrated, not put down. This attitude of celebrating curiosity is much more productive, rather than shaming someone for something that may be out of their control or experience. I would like to add that Cyrus's method only works if done from a place of humility. We should not seek to teach because we feel superior or pity those with less knowledge. That would be a path closer to Lucia or Yvonne's, done out of a superiority complex. This is an egotistical take, the action coming from the wrong place, and is nearly as bad as mocking someone for their lack of knowledge. Cyrus's method is best done with love, or at the very least from the mindset of a scholar, where knowledge is knowledge, and you impart that knowledge for the sake of sharing and educating. And when people do that in turn to you and others, it's an endless cycle of knowledge and understanding that can progress us all to greater heights. But I think I've said too much. Me explaining all that was likely unnecessary as Cyrus already said it perfectly. Unfortunately, this beautifully clear speech doesn't reach Lucia. I guess teaching does little if someone has already made up their mind to ignore it. She says if Cyrus wants to die without knowing the truth, then so, so be it. And using a complete blood crystal, she claims to remove the shackles of humanity and give herself immortality, so that she might have the time to understand everything. That's the thing in the picture. Uh, if that's what immortality looks like, I will absolutely pass. You are so not human anymore. That thing mad ugly. Why is its spine sticking out? Jeez. I find it interesting that this form is meant to be immortal, because that in the boss fight, it's really clear that her ribs are just out there. Like, your spinal cord is there for the taking, doesn't that make you right. more vulnerable? I'm pretty sure you're more likely to die now, but hey, what do I know about crazy lady scholar monsters? It has only one- Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's basically just a bigger, uglier version of what Master Yvonne was. That spine sticking out. Jokes aside, something that is rather interesting about the spy does indeed lie in Lucia's appearance. I don't know how on earth it took me until after I beat the game to make this connection, but Lucia looks similar to a previous what Chapter next? 4 boss, yet again a clue to an intertwining story, and making me think there is definitely more to that wall painting than meets the eye. After defeating Lucia, she drops the original copy of From the Far Reaches of Hell, and yet again we're presented with more of Cyrus's philosophy on knowledge, as Cyrus wonders how many lives have been lost to the dark knowledge of this book, and in turn corrects himself that knowledge is neither good or bad, 
but the heart of the reader is what determines that. Basically to say that the intentions of the reader are what can make knowledge good or bad. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this, as I mostly agree with Cyrus, but I think certain things are more likely, or are given the connotation, of being good or evil in tendency. But perhaps I'm wrong. Cyrus decides to decipher the tome, and come to a conclusion of his own. By returning to the library, we learned that the Twelve Gods sealed away an unholy power beyond the edge of the world, and left a warning for any who covet this forbidden power. After examining from the far reaches of hell, we learn that the book describes a horrifying rite that will bring back the sealed power from the edge of the world, as well as the secrets to life and death. This leads us back to the painting on the wall. Oh, well, would you look at that? With this information in hand, including the possible end of the world, we are once again prompted by the game to put the pieces of the puzzle together. The Twelve Gods sealed away the power of life and death, and like a golden fruit, this power tempts the hearts of men. The mural is a warning a calamity that will occur if the forbidden is unleashed. And Cyrus concludes that unlike Lucia, who saw the but book and mural as an invitation, he sees it as a warning. He wonders if he should destroy the tome and decides against it. And as this is the last chapter, I would sad. rather you see for yourself Cyrus's reasoning, and the conclusion to this epic tale. And as long as that darkness exists, people will find a way to work evil. I must preserve this knowledge, that we might put it to use for good, not evil. Thusly. And yet, there is much more I must learn. I must decipher and fold the contents of this tome and the murals in this place, and pass them on to those who would follow us. That one day, should we be threatened by forces from the far reaches of hell, yes, our descendants will possess the knowledge needed to protect this realm. First, I must return to Alistam and file a report on what I have seen here. Then, I must begin my analysis of the material I have collected. Yes, I'll be burning the midnight oil night after night, no doubt, and I can scarcely wait. <laughs> professor! Professor! Over here, Therese! stack of books seems to get bigger every time I see you. And I'll need twice again as many to have any hope of translating this ancient tome. Twice as many? Fascinating, is it not? A traditional fairy tale from a certain region mentioned a gate of sorts. And I could not help but notice a parallel to the mural I found. I see. Hence, these books on local folklore? Just so. Considering your subject from all possible angles is a fundamental principle of scholarly research. Ah, but I forget myself. Might I surmise that you've come here to inform me that it's time for class? Uh, yes. You're late, Professor. Pray forgive me, Your Highness. Very well then, my students, let us begin. To quote the words of one Susanna Grotoff, author of Knowledge is Light. The pursuit of knowledge is a journey with no destination. As long as people live, there is always something to learn. And so we learn. We record, we speak. Points connect, thus forming our history, our agency, our identity. This world we live in is not for or of any one individual, 
and neither is knowledge. And so I write and speak of all that I learned to plant seeds of knowledge that will be harvested by those who follow me. To you who have found my writings, read well these words, that they may help you build a bridge to a brighter future. Man, these ending cards hit hard. I worry for Therese. I hope she ends up alright. But aside from a killer ending, we are left with a big question. I had finished all the chapters, and I had fully expected the game to end there. But there had to be a reason the Gate of Finis kept coming up. There's no way the developers would put that in there for nothing, right? As I expressed my curiosity to my brother, he told me one thing. Finish the side quests. Well if you say so. Now this is the section where I finally get to gush about everything I wanted to put earlier in this video, but didn't because I was trying to keep y'all interested in this fantastic story. If you aren't interested in hearing some funny moments or my thoughts on the world building and extra side quests, feel free to skip ahead to the next section as that will continue the story. But for all the people watching the premiere, you're stuck with me. <laughs> yes. Octopath has some fantastic world building, and the side quests are part of that. Not only are the side quests uniquely crafted, but it takes advantage of the fact that every single NPC has a story. Yep, every NPC with a bubble above their head has a unique story and background, and there are a lot of them. One of my personal favorites is the Scarred on the left side of the Ravis Manor, or the post-game side quests you get with characters from the main chapters, such as the one with Noah and Cordelia. Turns out they write each other, Noah telling Cordelia of cool places and adventures she wants to have, and Cordelia sending her chapters of her story about a handsome thief. You too, huh? The man has too much riz. Like seriously, too much. My all-time favorite Traveler's Banter proves as much. It happened during the events of Therion's Chapter 3, and it had me invested. It is between Ophelia and Therion. Again, how does she always end up in these situations? It opens with Ophelia asking Therion if he's alright, and he says he's fine. Okay, it's just that your face is so uncharacteristically grim. You seem awfully interested in the state of my face. Is it that fascinating? Oh, Therion, you did not! But it gets better, because my girl Ophelia comes in here with, It's not about your face, nor my interest in it. You're in a mood, and I simply want to know why. My girl coming in here with the comeback! Well done. I would not have been able to keep my cool. That was too smooth. The scene ends with Ophelia apologizing for prying, and Therion saying not to worry about it. After all, a frown suits her less than it suits him. Oh, Therion, you're still at it. But this banter actually gives some really good insight into Therion. It's something I came to appreciate about the banters, giving further depth to the characters and the whole group dynamic. We see Therion's thoughts at the end of the banter, in which he thinks it really isn't a big deal, and that he can do this on his own. More evidence of Therion refusing help or support from other people. He finds witty ways to turn the conversation from him, because he doesn't want to share details about himself. He does this all the time to Cordelia and Heathcote as well, and it all comes down to trust or rather the lack of it. Maybe it scared him that Ophelia could read him so well, especially after he'd worked so hard to put his walls up. Thankfully, he begins coming out of that by the end of his story. But just as the banters added depth to the story, so did the stories of the NPCs. And they are actually the key to completing many of the side quests. As you learn about the NPCs, you'll find that a husband can't see his wife due to work, and oh, what do you know, here's a wife trying to travel to her working husband in another city. Let me just lead one to the other, and boom, side quest completed. This may seem tedious, but it's pretty easy if you take the time to read them. You don't have to memorize it or anything, but hey, if this really isn't your cup of tea, the wiki tells you exactly exactly how to do each one. Among the side quests I did, there's this one outside Whisper Mill where you have to kill this stupid wolf named Monogamir. Why is it stupid? Because this wolf is nearly as strong as the final boss of the game. Like what the heck, man? Why is this wolf in the middle of some random forest so overpowered? He'll randomly use this screech ability that nullifies all status effects, making the Tressa Runelord strat worthless. The one where you have her use a transfer rune and then her ability sidestep, which gives the whole party the ability to take no melee damage. Yeah, he only does melee damage, and now you can't defend against it. But you may be wondering, 
What is a Rune Lord? And what's up with all these fire fits my travelers are now wearing? <laughs> well, you see, this game has this feature called secondary jobs. Need an apothecary but don't have room for Alphan on your team? Throw it on Therion and now he's a stealing medicine man. <laughs> I forgot I wrote that, it's really funny. But there are four special jobs that require you to be the boss to get them. There's a grumpy wizard, a star lady, the living blender, and that one guy from Star Trek. With my current level, the sorcerer and starseer abilities weren't hard to get. Then there was Rune Lord, and he took multiple tries. There comes a time in the fight where he just throws every rune ever at you, and you're taking obscene amounts of elemental damage. The War Master, now she's just as bad, but if you have Rune Lord, you just put it on Tressa and boom, you're invincible. War Master only does physical attacks, so it's entirely broken, and I definitely used it. I really loved Therion in the Rune Lord job because he looked so fine with that bright blue to complement his hair, but he also looked sick as the War Master, and this would eventually become my main strategy for the final boss. But first, I had to finish the side quests, which I found rather enjoyable, aside from Monogamir and the Devourer of Men. That thing is weird. But in general, they gave more details and depth to the game. You'll find that the NPCs' lives all interconnect, similar to how our travelers' lives had begun to. There's so much to discover, it's incredible. But despite the numerous amounts of side quests, only two of them are actually important. The first one is literally the first side quest of the game, Kit, which I talked about earlier in Prim's chapters. Turns out the ending of the game really is planned out from the beginning. The first time we met Kit, he was off to try and find his father. The second time we meet him in Noble Corp. He is finding it difficult to travel on his own and asks for help in finding a group to travel with. We set him up with the traveling circus and call it a day. Next, he is on Moonstruck Coast. He has a clue to his father's whereabouts and will be leaving the troop to seek it out. We help him give a parting gift to the troop and he sets off. Next is the side quest titled Daughter of the Dark God. Strange. The contents of this side quest line go like this. There's this girl, Live Black, looking for the perfect man. And there's this mercenary who's smitten by her and wishes he could get her to notice him. Live Black ain't having it though. So we eventually find a nice girl who's perfect for the mercenary. And Live Black says she's close to finding her man. Good for you, I guess. Wish I could just know like that. You must have a very particular type. After finishing these two side quest lines, it all comes to a head. Alphys and the Impresario. While in the Swarky Woods, you'll come across the circus, with the leader saying they wish to travel down the path, but there's a monster there. A traveling swordsman came by and said he'd defeat it, but then he hobbles up to the group saying he couldn't do it. And what do you know? It's the mercenary we helped from the Dark God side quest. They ask us to defeat the beast, and literally two inches away is a tiger we have to fight. We defeat it. Nice. nice. The leader of the circus troop says they had heard from Kit. He's meeting with a woman who knows about his father, and Alphys gives news that Lie Black is off to meet with her perfect man, in Hornburg. Oh no. We talk with the circus man again and a new location is revealed on the map, along with the final quest, at Journey's End. The ruins of Hornburg. Oh boy. I can tell things are about to get interesting. I took a bit to 100% all the chests in the game and tidy up some other things. Achievements be like. And with that, I headed off to Hornburg for the first time. We spawn in the location of the final battle of Hornburg eight years ago. <gasps> There's no music, which is seriously ominous. I make my way down the path until eventually I get to the gate. Kit is there asking if his father is truly through the gate. Lyblak says he is, and Kit then goes through. My party leader runs up and Lyblak says Kit is her soulmate and she'll be oh, needing him. She says there is nothing we can do and that if I want to follow, that's my choice. But once you enter the gate, you cannot return. And then boom, she's gone. What on earth is on the other side? I enter the gate and immediately the music sets the mood. There appear to be eight blue flames sitting on pedestals, and when approaching one it asks you if you want to do battle with the unholy presence. I agree and suddenly I'm met with a blue Darius. I don't know what's going on, but I guess I gotta fight him now? I beat him and then I'm met with an empty pedestal I can examine again. I go to the next flame and now I'm fighting the dragon from Hornets chapter 3. It seems that all the flames are bosses from each of the characters' chapters. Okay, interesting. I eventually got the rhythm down for beating these bosses. By getting Therion to 1 HP and utilizing the support skills, surpassing power, and fortitude, I was able to have him one-shot the bosses as long as I broke them. Dude. Warmaster is so broken. Eventually, I'd come to beat these guys in three turns or less. After beating the second boss, I decided to re-examine the pedestal and was met with a surprise. From the Diary of Graham Crossford, part the third. Wait, so part the third, wait, hold on. These are each books. After defeating each boss, a book appears with a short account. I'm going to arrange these so the story makes the most sense, but buckle your seatbelts. You're about to get some killer lore. 
First is an account from Cordelia's father explaining their family's role in maintaining certain treasures. The greatest of these treasures is the Dragonstones given to House Ravis from King Beowulf, the first king of Hornburg. The Dragonstones are named for the power of the dragons that is held within them. Once upon a time, Odin Crossford, a great sorcerer, created the Dragonstones to seal the Gate of Finnis, and King Beowulf entrusted the stones to the one he trusted most, a loyal knight who would become Lord Ravis. Now it is the job of the descendants to protect the stones, so this great power, which could bring about much good, might not be used for evil by the wrong hands. Many have tried to acquire the Dragonstones, even close family. Cordelia's father worries for her, that she will be deceived by those who feign kindness, but he holds out hope she will find someone she can trust in. Next is Matthias, who once believed in the teachings of the Sacred Flame. He was a servant of the church and a pious believer, but that began to change. The town he served burned to the ground, and many people died, including young children. He prayed that they might return that a miracle might occur, but after offering up every scrap of faith he had, he realized it did nothing, and he came to the conclusion that if his faith did nothing to bring the people succor, then his faith was useless. He didn't care if the power was forbidden. He was determined to gain power over life and death and use it for good. It was not something I had been tricked into by another. I had reached enlightenment. It was only fitting that such a revelation came to me, the one true savior. Hmm. Sounds like you're trying to convince yourself, bud. Libelac gave him a hundred years of extra life, something learned from a tome she shared with him, and he set out to kindle a darker flame. He waited many years, until those who knew him died, no one remembering he was an apostate of the church, and then worked his way back into the church as the traitor Matthias. Every step of the way, fate has shown me that I am in the right. I was able to uncover Galdera's altar because I am right. I was able to use a fragment of Galdera's power to bring about a miracle because I am right. I could become the savior of Whispermill and command its people to do my wishes because I am right. Is it just me or is this guy a little power crazy? Simeon was apparently working with Matthias, giving him money and power. The obsidians gave him a poison he used to kill the archbishop, Ophelia's father. He intended to cast a shadow on the heart of Liana so the flame would burn black, but then Ophelia became the flame bearer. He is now in anguish. He was meant to bring Galdera's flame into the world and now he is stuck in darkness. It is dark here, the blackness, it is all consuming, darker than a a thousand starless nights. Please, someone, anyone, bring me some light. Following with Simeon's storyline, we get an account from Geoffrey Azelhart. He talks about how he kept true to his faith. When the Obsidians came to Noble Court, he would not listen to their sweet words. He dug into their ties and connections to find what they were about, and in doing so, discovered the Gate of Finnis. He was killed once the Obsidians caught wind of his discoveries. He regrets nothing, except that he has left Primrose to pick up the broken pieces. He is proud of her for finding purpose and for continuing the path he begun. He begs she forgive him for the loneliness she has had to suffer. He says it is time for her to rest. Time to forget him and find a happiness of her own. He will always be with her. Moving on to an account from Yvonne. It looks like 15 years ago he had thought the position of headmaster out of reach. That is, until one of his students, Lucia, brought a woman to him who told him a man of his ability was best suited for the role. She taught him many things, including the existence of ancient tomes with forbidden knowledge. Only the headmaster had access to these. She told him of a tome, an account from a sorcerer named Solomon, and deciphering its true meaning is said to give men power over life and death. The woman, who was very clearly libelac at this point, wanted to decipher the the book to share with those worthy, and using flowery words assured Yvonne he was the genius to do it. Yvonne is like, yes, of course, how can the idiots that are my colleagues not see how great I am? Libelac asks him to remove the current headmaster and he has him assassinated, soon becoming headmaster himself. He never saw Libelac again. He set to studying the tome, and Lucia kept contact with Libelac to gain other ancient texts, and the rest of the account is him cursing Lucia for double-crossing him and bringing Libelac into his life, calling them both witches. About this time is when Liblack came to Werner when he was a mercenary, saying, Hornburg will fall, and employed him to take the kingdom down, giving him as much money as he needed to accomplish the task. He created a mercenary group by the name of the Black Brotherhood, and using Liblack's connections made his group very sought after in Hornburg. He took the worst of his men and made them into bandits to attack the edges of the kingdom, where his mercenaries would go and defeat them. No one else stood a chance to come to the rescue in time. The people loved them, and using these people he found ways to introduce himself to higher houses in Hornburg, infiltrating the noble circles. But the king was in the way, so he set Erhard in the king's own guard and had him assassinate him, twisting Erhard's hatred for the king that already existed. I could spout any lie and it would not have mattered. Humans care little for facts, they believe what they want to believe. In the end, it took me just 12 short years to bring Hornbrook to ruin. 12 years to take down an entire long-standing kingdom. Wow. 
After this, he disbanded the Black Brotherhood, used his money to buy himself lands and a title, and set himself up for the life he'd always wanted. He could have stayed with Lai Black and gained far more power, but to do so would be madness. For while Lai Black was beautiful, he didn't desire her. He saw pure evil within her, intent on bringing humanity to ruin. A lethal poison. A witch. And so, he cut ties, though in the end, she still brought about his ruin. For in the end, just as I felt Hornberg, it was Hornberg's last night who laid me low. Which leads us into an account from Graham Crossford, which has three parts, and will tie the remaining pieces together. Graham was on a journey to find ingredients for the medicine to save his dying wife. He gets news her condition has worsened, and takes a boat captained by Leon Bastral to reach his final destination. He needs an ogre eagle feather, but Leon wouldn't let him on board the ship, so Graham offered him his greatest possession a journal, containing accounts from all across the continent. Leon accepts the journal, and Graham prays that his wife might hold on a little longer. I know not what has become of my journal since I parted ways with Captain Leon, but looking back, I am relieved that it left my hands when it did. Surely it is better that my final entry ended with someone- with some- that my final entry ended with some traces of hope rather than the bitter pain I would eventually find at journey's end. Graham was too late. He had the finished elixir in hand, but his wife passed beyond the grave. After the funeral, a woman named Lyblack came to him in his grief, and asked a foreboding question. Wouldn't you like to see your beloved once more? She explained that the Gate of Thinnis separates this world from the next, and that opening it would allow his wife to come back to his side. So, he took off to the southeast where the gate was located. On his way, he passed through Clearbrook, and found a young boy, convulsions racking him, and purple pox all over the same sickness that killed his wife. Seeing this as a twist of fate, he used the medicine to treat the boy. If he could not save his wife, he would at least save this boy. And seeing the boy at rest, he saw the face of his wife as well, and felt peace. The boy said he wanted to follow in his footsteps and become an apothecary one day, and Graham felt that his journey was worthwhile after all. He left his medicines with the boy, and turned once more toward the Gate of Venice, the biggest mistake of his life. Libelac leads him to the gate, and he is instantly repelled by it. Libelac draws a rune circle, definitely normal, and tells Graham this is the way to open the gate. It won't be pleasant, but it's necessary if he wants to see his wife again. He feels great pain and begins to transform, realizing that he's a vessel to bring back some horror from the gate. This won't bring his wife back. I would be lying if I said I had no idea this was coming. My conversations with Libelac had led me to suspect that this ritual would not work for just anyone. It seemed that she needed my blood, the blood of House Crossford, descended from an ancient line of sorcerers. That is why I must be the one to prove. I, I must be the one to prevent her plan from succeeding. For if I fail, she will only turn her sights upon my dear Kit. Oh, <gasps> Kit is his son. No. That I cannot allow, so while I realized before the end what Live Black intended, I continued to accompany her in her aims, so that I could see the truth of the ritual for myself and foil it however I could. Wait, I'll be lying if I said it. Okay. Little did I know that I was dealing with a power far, far beyond any mortal's control or conception. He begins losing himself, but the memory of his family brings him back for a moment. With a final burst of energy, he lashes out at Libelac, interrupting the ritual. Here, there begins a strange pattern of capitalized and uncapitalized letters. The puzzle and mystery side of my brain kicked in, but in the end, I don't think these letters were actually meant to spell anything. Rather, it's showing signs of his transformation, his language becoming strange. He loses sense of himself, and he says he now roams, waking to great destruction around him, and he knows he did it despite having no memory of it. These blackouts grow more frequent, they come for me now. No, stay your hand. I am no monster. I'm a man. I am a man. Is he Red Eye? Red Eye was Graham Crossford. Alfin. I'm so sorry, dude. Reading Lie Black's wiki page, I was able to find the last pieces of information, piecing together the information that was still confusing or missing. Some of this is apparently mentioned in the Octopath mobile game, which I haven't played. Salomon, who was mentioned in Yvonne's account, is the author of From the Far Reaches of Hell. About 200 years ago, he had opened the Gate of Finnis, and at that time, Lie Black, Galdera's daughter, came into the world. Beowulf used the dragonstones created by Odin Crossford to seal the gate, and he also founded the Kingdom of Hornburg around it, most likely to protect it so it would never be opened again. 
again. But this makes me wonder about the location of the ruins Cyrus discovered, since they are opposite the continent to Hornburg. Simeon is apparently a prince from 126 years ago, whose life Lyblak extended along with Matthias, and the two established the Obsidians to be Lyblak's private forces. Simeon led it, Matthias created a cult to serve Galdera and planned to weaken Alfric's flame to allow Galdera's power back, all while being financially supported in his efforts by Simeon. Lyblak uses Werner to begin destroying Hornburg and eventually regain access to the gate. Using Lucia and Yvonne, she gets access to From the Far Reaches of Hell so she can open the gate, stealing the Dragonstones either to open the gate or scatter them so it'd be harder to close it again. Finally, she began the search for Graham Crossford, as she needed a vessel to bring her father back. When that failed and he became Red Eye, she turned her eyes on his son. Kit. In case it wasn't clear, Graham and Kit Crossford are the descendants of Odin Crossford, the great sorcerer who sealed the gate, and apparently they have the stuff of the Dark God in their veins, no doubt something to do with being the bloodline that sealed the gate, and this is why Lyblak needed them specifically. The lady from Tressa's chapter 4 was part of the Obsidians. They were looking for Graham's journal for Lyblak, hoping it would reveal Kit's location, though in the end it was a useless lead, and she found him anyway. As I defeated the last of the chapter bosses, another gate opened up. What lay behind? Well, apparently, journey's end. A long staircase awaited me, and on the way up, the game has you form two parties for the final fight. I thought nothing of this and continued, eager to see what happened next. The cutscene starts. All eight characters run up to Lyblak. An ominous dark flame appears, and Lyblak says the 13th god, the fallen Galdera, and Kit are now one and the same. She talks about the Gate of Finnis being created to seal Galdera away, about the Crossford line having the stuff of the Dark God in their veins, part of the reason Odin Crossford was able to create the Dragonstones, I imagine. She repeats what we know about Graham, and reveals the eight travelers also have a role in this day. Their souls will feed Galdera and give him strength. She calls to her father. He answers back and for doing her job, he grants her eternal slumber? Oh, well, she's gone, and the fire is bigger. Something just happened. And apparently we also get this gift. Looks like Galdera's goal is to consume everything, the world, the other gods, all so he can be alone. Like, I get it, you're an introvert, but this is a little extreme, man. What is the point of all this, oh, flamey one? I don't think this one will listen to reason. Oh, maybe not so much a flame anymore. What a lovely eye you have. Blech. I wish I could explain this fight and say it was easy. Yeah, 20 plus hours of my playtime was taken up by this boss fight. Maybe more. The first fight, I learned that the Omniscient Eye deals a lot of damage. Like, a lot. And it's also annoying because you have to destroy these souls on the side before you can even touch the eye. You destroy one and then two more appear. And now, if you don't destroy these souls at roughly the same time before the eye has a turn, it uses its turn to summon them again. Hmm. Galdera attacked Therion, leaving him at one health, because he's just a chad like that, and I was able to do some major damage. Or so I thought. This thing has a lot of health. Another wave of souls arrives, having elemental weaknesses that rotate one to the right every time you attack them. Easy enough. I could even line them all up so I can break them at the same time. I'm ready. Are you? Show no mercy. Ah, that never gets old. I destroy the souls to get some damage on the eye, and I've done it. It looked like a part two was in the works, but then there's a cutscene of the eye being destroyed. It's only part one, though. Or did I actually just defeat it? Did I just defeat Galdera? Galdera? No way. Yeah, no. That was the bottom part. There's the top! With all of the guys. That's a big thing you got there. You won't move willingly! Oh no! I have to defeat him with my second party? Victory shall be mine! Crap. Yeah, that's the sound of me realizing my weakest party members, who don't have any weapons equipped right now, are now left to fight what is probably the much harder second phase. The two-party fight is a cool feature, but man am I screwed. <laughs> this is a cruel joke, right? Oh, there's a head, ew. 
That's lilac, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I've heard that you can see Kit in the omniscient eye, though I've never had the heart to examine that disgusting thing long enough to see if it's true. Oh, there goes Tressa. Let's bring her back. Oh, Alfin's gone. And Hanit. And yeah, you know, it wouldn't be complete without killing off Holbrook and Tressa again, now would it? It's honestly impressive that I got past the first stage on my first try, because the road ahead would be rough. The reason this fight took me so long was because three of my party members were sitting around level 34. I need to go complain for a minute. We're just gonna- we're gonna stop this recording and do another one. I'm thinking I might be able to beat Goldera even with my guys this low. I just need to be strategic about this. And I refused to put in the time to level them up for this fight. Which was dumb, because in the end that would have saved me time. Either way, this fight does take a bit, because every time you have to fight the eight flame bosses to even get a chance at stage one Galdera, it was taking me about 20 minutes just to get to the fight, and you get no save points once you enter the gate. I optimized my team and went in. I tried everything, changing my comp where I could, using broken strats like Tressa Roomlord. I had Alphan on team one healing everyone like crazy, trying to buy time to do damage since my main damage dealers needed to be on stage two. All in all, I attempted the fight six more times. Dude, I'm barely staying alive in this fight. This is not okay. That's unfortunate. Ow. Have you tried what? not doing that? <laughs> yes. Here it works wonders. Only getting to stage two again on the final try, where I got my brother in a Discord call to help me. We strategized and bounced around ideas, barely scraping by stage one. I got to deal with another phase of the eye, the cursed phase, where you have a limited number of rounds to kill the souls before your guys die. But on the plus side, the eye can also be attacked during this phase. Using Cyrus as my rune lord and using transfer rune then light rune, I had my whole party doing decent damage while healing everyone with offense concoct. It took an hour and a half, but we did get to stage two. I was living, somehow. I destroyed the extremities and got to Galdera, the Fallen. The crucial attack round comes. Hey, okay, just uh, enjoy the pump. You're guaranteed. You're guaranteed victory now. Yeah. Enjoy the pump. We're L on Therion right now. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to use Primos to do that. I'm going to armor corrosive him. Mm, good, good. I see through the defenses. I am ready. Stay strong. Hey. Here we go. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, um, oh crap. Wait, can you boost his physical? No. I, I can't anymore. No. I ha I would have had to do that with- I could have done it with- Just- just refreshing- yeah, never mind. Uh, I don't know. Probably refreshing jam will work just in case. I- but I'm pretty sure guaranteed victory, but... Yeah. Using this. Hey. Right. Might as well be safe. <laughs> yep. Here you go. Let's do this! Show no mercy. It didn't kill still? No way. Twelve seconds later. I'm scared. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't kill this guy. He must be living Use off of this. literally nothing. Show no mercy. He was on 19,000 health. <sighs> okay, well, she's still alive. No, keep no fine. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. One more. This guy's broken. No, he keeps going! That guy is okay. You know what the most annoying thing is? We could have beat him. If I'd done as my brother said and had Therion use an energizing pomegranate instead of armor corrosive, I could have had Primrose use Lion Dance on him, giving him a 1.5 times damage multiplier. I almost did it. I'd almost beat Galdera having three severely underleveled guys. I gave in. I'd have to level up my team. I spent a good three or so hours doing this. I also grinded for two physical belts from Gustav in the forest outside Atlas Dam, trying to get Therion's physical damage as high as I could since I unfortunately gave all my sharp nuts to Primrose and could no longer max his damage stats. Having his physical attack damage all the way up might have also saved the run. And these two things haunt me. But it was fine. 
I now had everyone level 60 or above. There was no way I could lose. The fight is going great. I'm like 17 minutes into the Galdera fight itself, already to the cursed soul stage. This okay. guy's toast. And then this soul does something called self-emotion. Oh, oh no. no! Oh my gosh. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I nearly died. What was that? So, looks like the Wailing and Screaming Souls, the top and middle one, have an ability called the Sorcerous Energies within the Wailing Soul are about to burst. Which means if the soul isn't killed by the next round, it will use self-emulsion, basically morbing on everyone and doing more than enough damage to kill my team. I only survived because I had Hang Tough on Tressa, allowing her to live on 1 HP, and with my precise gaming skill, got everyone back alive. The fight continues, and I discover another final soul stage, where the eye brings back three souls only to absorb them, giving him more shields and a status buff. I get a really good turn order, breaking him and killing the eye before he gets his three turn round. Wait, this is great! I'm about to do it! He had 12,000 health. Are you telling me that being 56 points off full physical damage is keeping this guy alive? <laughs> my only hope is to layer the attack with armor corrosive. Or maybe my support skills are wrong. Do I need to break him? What more do you want from me? Well, let's try again. Okay. Well, surely- Oh, now all of a sudden this is your favorite attack, huh? I fight you seven times, never using this ability, and now the universe decides to hate me! I've been trying this fight for four days! But the completionist in me refuses to let this go. Galdera, you gotta understand, I need to destroy you. Stop being difficult! We're refining it. <gasps> I got it! I captured it! The hunt ended. It was very nice. Alright. I'm leaving no broken strat unturned. I switch Hana onto my first team. She now has a beast called the Devourer of Dreams. When summoned at a full boost, it one-shots anything that isn't a boss. And you know what doesn't count as a boss? The souls. Yeah, try self-uploading now, you little jerks. Stage one, I'm prepared now. I go through the fight. Devourer of dreams, boom, you're dead. Devourer of dreams. <gasps> I forgot to boost it, no! Okay, I'm kinda screwed. That beast only has two uses. How is this gonna play out? Could kill the bottom one. No, okay, good, good, good. Something wild the next turn? Great. Nice. Oh goodness, Ophelia, you have saved us all. And after that, it was all just too easy. Breaking him before he could summon any more souls. The turn order coming out just right. He summons some souls, it doesn't matter. We go for the eye. All right, kind of failed. We ran out of light room. No worries, we go for the souls now. The turn order now sucks, but it's fine. We stay hungry, the eye decides to devour, but not dreams, because whoever needed that beast anyway. The eye is obviously low if it felt the need to consume its souls. Go. So I make a final push. I don't know what's gonna go here. What in the- What? Huh? I don't know what happened to Alfin. Yeah. Neither do I. I think he's petrified? But we got no time to think about that. Attack! Whew, okay, no stress. Second half, we got this. I'm gonna have to really think through this. If I can't break him, I need Ulbrich to use Aubrey's Reckoning. This should be just enough to get him. Spawn in, boom. Fantastic turn order. This is already looking so much better than before. Tressa gives BP to Therion. Therion destroys the three extremities. Primrose gives BP to Therion. Galdera makes a move. He will go twice after Ulbrick next round, but his defenses are open. Ulbrick, what can you do, buddy? Thousand Spears, we get lucky with it, and it hits six times. Ooh, I think we have a really good chance of breaking him here, but surprise! Tressa's support skill patience triggers. We can break him! Yes! 
Oh! Ulbrich is thief now has a spare turn. He puts on armor corrosive. I mess up and don't have promos do lion dance, but it doesn't matter. Goldera the Fallen is broken. His defenses are down. I'm ready. Are you? Show no mercy. Bird, baby bird! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! It's all coming together. <laughs> it smells so good. Don't start things you can't finish. Oh my damn! 20,000. And we were untouched. Ooh, baby, yes. <laughs> I could cry, guys. I've been trying this fight for so many hours. I was so happy I turned into a southern mama. That's how you know I was happy. Ah. Uh, 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 uh. A bliss interpretation. No. I am all powerful, eternal. I will not return to the darkness. I will not. It was really bad. It's cold read, it's fine. Indeed it was, but we've got more important things to worry about. What took me hours had now only taken me 24 minutes. I was free. Huh? Where am I? see thank you my friends <sighs> she told me that i could meet father here but it was all just a lie kid oh father mother kit oh how you've grown No mortal knows what fate holds for them. All these years, I had thought my journey a futile one. Only now do I know it was not so, all because of you. In journeying here, you have not just found meaning in your own lives. You have sealed away the darkness and restored light to all of Orsteria. Orstera. For this, I thank you. Live on for us, Kit. Oh. Live on and live strong. Wow. The gate is sealed. Oh, it's doing it with Alfin. I guess that's fitting. For life is a journey. The places you go, the deeds you do, the tales whose hero you become. Every road is yours to take. So journey forth, friend, into this great world we live in, and find an adventure all your own. Dude, what a fantastic story. I'm like tearing up. Defeating Galdera gives you a ribbon that wards off all enemy encounters, which would have been so useful when I was 100%ing all the chests. But that isn't my main point. The reason I made this video, the reason this game changed my life, is because of this. For all that you may lose your way in life, questioning your faith and finding you have no cause to believe in, for all that you must push on, wondering if life is really all that worth it, wondering if you can ever trust again, trying to find your next big adventure, trying to prove yourself, saving a loved one, mourning loss, or fighting for a cause you believe in. It's all a journey. It's a path. Your path. It may be different than others. It may connect with some, or you may not even know what path it is you take. But it's yours. All yours. The possibilities as endless as you make them. Octopath came to me at a dire time in my life, and I can't begin to express to you how much this game changed me. It gave me hope when I needed it. It reminded me of what was important, and it was worth every bit of my time. Why did all eight stories start separate? Because as a player, we needed to see the beauty in a journey, to see that our own paths are just as important as any other, that we change lives whether we mean to or not. 
In the end, it all came together in classic JRPG fashion, saving the world from crisis. But beyond the nostalgia factor and sticking to the unspoken rule of JRPGs, this served another purpose. The power of shared experiences, and the expansive impact a single person can have on any moment of another's life. I don't pretend this game is perfect. I don't pretend it's everyone's cup of tea. But it's important to me. It's a lesson in art. A showcase of what happens when talented people come together to make a masterpiece. And this video was an opportunity to share something beautiful that I couldn't pass up. And maybe, just maybe, I hope that this game made even a small impact on your life. That if nothing else, it might have given you hope. I'm done. Wait, I'm done!